And this time it would not take place without the help received from organizations, masters of architecture, uh, led by Justyna Boruch and Wojciech Fudala, who are also our, our uh, guest speakers. Uh, two years ago, Coventry University started the idea of uh, creating the symposiums. Uh, and the first time we invited two guest speakers uh, who talked about expression and uh, representation in architecture. Uh, last year, we hosted five international guest speakers from three different countries, in, uh, which is the same as it is now. Uh, who did not only share with us their professional experience, but also their advice regarding problems of climate change. So today we would like to introduce you to a topic uh, that has been present for many years, however, never so exempt as today. We would like to talk about the next steps towards healthy architecture. And Sometimes there is needed one building or one moment in history that may conclude or initiate new movements. And taking a closer look what Le, Le Corbusier did in his book uh, to the Parthenon, uh, which is the symbol of, of course, classical and Greek ar architecture, it did not invent or create new forms or plans, but rather gathered the best solutions of its epoch and made them as efficient as possible. Then they were, they were used as a standard wave of construction up till today. Having in mind the restrictions that we have had to adapt for the last few months, we can even say that they forced us to learn new standards of living. After spending so much time in one place, our reflections and feelings from it um, came to the point to be even overwhelming. The situation made us define based on numerous sources, comments, and experience that we had to come back to the same ideas that were described in the times of modernists, which is mainly a wise design of space and light. However, is that all we can do? Is it all that we as designers are able to do to initiate a new post-pandemic movement? Or do we really need to begin something new? as Le Corbusier, as I said, did with a book towards a new architecture. Or maybe it would be enough to create an environment that would adapt to the regulations of being socially distanced. So these are the problems that our five guest speakers had to meet with while preparing for today's talks. Uh, we chose um, our guest speakers basing on their diverse experience in different scales, such as private, um, public or urban projects. However, we'll not lack a person whose studies are more focused uh, on anthropological profile. And just to let everyone know, uh, each speaker uh, has around 20 minutes to present their views, and then it will be followed by panel discussion led by Ms. Maugajata Congela. And everything is going to be recorded and shared on our Facebook group and on YouTube. And if you want to ask any questions, feel free to write them in the comments during the presentations. And at the end, we are going to have a short Q&A session where uh, guest speakers will answer uh, them. So our first speaker is an ambitious and creative identity whose voice can be heard in more cases than you can imagine. His persona represents not only SARP Katowice or series of talks, Masters of Architecture, but also Robert Konieczny KWK Prom's office. Let's all welcome Wojciech Fudala, whose presentation will talk about multidisciplinarity as a response to sincerely preceptive world. And Wojciech, you may start. Okay, thank you for uh, this uh, very nice introduction. I will just uh, share my screen uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, you can all, uh, you are all able to see it. So thank you. My name is Wojciech Fudala and uh, as uh, Alexander and Małgorzata said, uh, I um, represent uh, the Sarp Katowice where we organize the Masters of Architecture series of lecture where we invite uh, very important international uh, and interesting architects uh, to Katowice, to our city in Poland, where four times a year they give uh, interesting uh, speeches. I'm also an architect in Kawuka Promes office, that's a Polish, uh, Polish office based in Katowice. 
but also I'm an interior designer and uh, I must tell you that uh, today I've received the new edition of Metropolitan magazine. Um, so I can uh, show it to you here. So uh, there is a publication, there is a publication of um, my latest uh, interior, which I did in cooperation with uh, Kinga Gowombeck. And uh, just a few minutes before the presentation, I decided to change uh, it and add some slides to share it with you. Because uh, in my opinion, the interior design is uh, very underestimated. Uh, especially today, at the times of the pandemic, we spent uh, about 95% of our life in interiors. So um, I think that it's a very important uh, discipline of, uh, of architecture. Also in the Metropolitan Magazine, uh, we talk about it more uh, in an interview. But let's get back to the main topic of, uh, of, of my speech, uh, which is synesthetic design. So no one knows what uh, the future will be, and no one knows uh, what the future of architecture will be, but uh, there are some possible ways. And uh, synesthetic design is uh, one of them, which is, in my opinion, a very possible way of uh, how architecture will move on in the years ahead. But uh, what is it? That's a difficult, uh, difficult uh, term. So let's check what does it mean. So synesthesia. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, synesthesia is uh, a neurological condition in which information meant to stimulate one sen of your senses only uh, stimulates several of your senses. So briefly, synesthetic design is architecture that considers uh, all the senses, not only one. Okay, uh, so that's an engraving by Claude Nicolas Ledoux. And um, from 18, uh, from, from 1804. And uh, it proved, it shows that architecture has always been considered as an art of the eye. But um, according to neurologists, uh, architecture is much more uh, multisensory than uh, it has been previously previously considered. And um, our brain is, uh, as well as it's visual, it's also, um, it's also sensible for the other four senses. And uh, we should, we should uh, ask ourselves what we have lost, for, what our buildings have lost, uh, but when they were designed, for only for the visual. So that's also a, that's a quotation by Maria Lorena Lehmann. It's a, an architecture writer and critic. And she said that as the human body moves, sees, touches, hears, and even tastes within a space, the architecture comes to life. So uh, in this presentation, I would like to uh, give you examples of all the senses uh, and uh, how can architecture can touch all these senses um, and how it already touched. So I give you, I will give you some examples to illustrate that, to illustrate to how the situations looks like today. Uh, I will also give you some examples how can we mix uh, all the five senses to create so-called synesthetic design. And I will also give you some examples how not to do it. Okay, so let's go. Let's start with the smell, and uh, that's a sense that is of course considered by architects but usually in a negative aspect. Uh, so it means uh, eliminating uh, unpleasant odors. So uh, let's start with the building that uh, you all know. Um, it's uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier from 1931. And as you can see, uh, Le Corbusier was already thinking about, uh, about the senses and about the smell, especially when he was working on this project. So take a look uh, on this on this uh, on these plans. Here we can see the third ground floor plan. That's a first floor plan, and here and here you can see the roof terrace, and the kitchen is located here. So in fact, he actually located kitchen on the roof to uh, negate to negate the possibility of cooking aromas permitting the building. And here we can see more contemporary building. It's a, a Barclays Center uh, by shop architects in uh, New York. And uh, in this building, the architects created a special signature scent for this building. 
So uh, usually uh, enterprises have their visual identity. And here in this case, we can tell about identity of fragrance that is characteristic for this building only. Okay, let's uh, move forward. Now uh, we have hearing and uh, similarly to smell, uh, that's a sense that is usually, uh, um, the sound of a space is usually addressed uh, in terms of uh, how to avoid noise. So acoustic walls appears very often in uh, our projects. And that's another example by Le Corbusier. So that was an architect who really considered, considered all the senses uh, in, uh, in his project. So uh, that's um, the convent of La Tourette. And it's the last project of Le Corbusier that he realized in, uh, in Europe. So to, in this project, uh, Le Corbusier was cooperating with Yanis Xenakis, perhaps you have heard about that. He was both an architect and a composer. And uh, in the late uh, project of Le Corbusier, he often cooperated, uh, he cooperated with him. And that's an, that's, an, uh, that's an example, because in this project, the main goal was uh, to activate a human's ear as the primary organ of sensing space instead of the eye. So uh, first of all, when you get there, uh, you don't know where's the main entrance. You don't know where's the threshold of the convent. So when you get there, usually the buildings uh, have the entrance that is uh, clearly uh, that is clearly indicated. Here we can't see where we should go. So uh, the only things that we can hear are voices from the inside and uh, vespers, bells from the church. So uh, we just follow the stands to find, uh, to, uh, to, find uh, to find the entrance. So it's some kind of a labyrinth uh, for, for the ear. So finally, when we find the threshold, we can see uh, the heavy brass door uh, and a dark space uh, behind them. So, uh, and only very low light. So we get there and uh, this lowered light uh, aimed to weaken the eye and to activate the ear as the primary organ of sensing space. Okay, now we move forward to touch uh, in, other, in, other, uh, in other of our senses. So uh, that's the sense that was considered uh, by architects uh, from the very ancient times. So you can ask how, that's an example. It's a Roman bath, but also Japanese baths, uh, also the hearth, uh, sauna, and many, many more. But here you have um, a more contemporary example. It's the Getty Center by Richard Mayer in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, here you can see the slanting wall that is adjacent to smooth curving hill uh, of the lawn. And uh, it works as uh, an invitation to touch. So that's another project at the beginning. Uh, I told you that I uh, a member of the team of Kavuka Promise uh, office. So it's so-called living garden house. We design so-called living garden houses. It means that uh, there is a grass that permits the building, it gets inside. And as a result, uh, instead of a living room, we have a living garden. So that's an example of uh, a living garden uh, in Katowice. And uh, I must tell you that at the beginning, the clients were afraid of uh, this solution. But uh, finally, from the first day that uh, they moved in, they are delighted with that. And also their children prefer to spend time in the living garden instead of uh, their own rooms. They prefer to play there. So that's another living garden house that uh, we designed one year later in Izbica, also in Poland. But now I want to see you, I want to show you another project. It's a, a living garden house in Kassel in Germany, where we want to go move uh, a step forward. So in this example, uh, the grad, all the floors of the house are covered uh, by grass. So it's not uh, only the living room, but the whole ecosystem gets inside the house. So here you can see the floor plan. So the only spaces that are not covered by grass are the wet rooms. It means the kitchen and the bathroom. So uh, to design this house, we had to cooperate with a multidisciplinary disciplinary, uh, team, uh, of, uh, team, of, uh, team of experts, uh, like biologists, uh, physicists, uh, and many more. And uh, 
take a look that's how it works. Uh, here you can see the hybrid grass, which is reinforced by special fibers um, to make it uh, to make it um, uh, stronger. Also here and here you can see some kind of uh, vacuum cleaners and lawn mowers, which are inseparable part uh, of this uh, of this house. So uh, they are uh, they get energy from sun and work uh, as uh, lawn mowers uh, to 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 to, to make. Uh, the height of the grass uh, comfortable. Also, uh, what can I tell you? Here you can see some LED lights that they are also necessary uh, to eliminate uh, the microbes that may appear in the grass. Also, this grass is watered uh, in the root level, so the floor is always wet and pleasant. So this uh, house, I must tell you that this house is uh, always uh, this house brings a new quality of life and uh, it stimulates um, our sense of touch in a very natural way all the day and night. Okay, so let's move forward to test. And uh, this is the most, uh, most difficult sense to be connoted in architecture. However, uh, I can give you some examples. So uh, here you can, see, uh, you can see a sofa and uh, what taste would you associate with this picture? Is it uh, bitter, sweet, salty, sour? So I'm sure that uh, the majority of you thought about uh, sweetness because uh, both the color pink and the curvature uh, is associated with uh, sweetness. So this sofa primes notions of sweet taste. Yeah, so there are others uh, like bubble gum or sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's it. So that's a contrary example. Uh, so that's the interior that I showed you at the beginning that was published in the Metropolitan magazine. That's a contrary because uh, as pink colors are great for spaces like cafe or uh, places of, 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 uh, of restaurants maybe, but uh, it's not a good color for, for our apartments. But on the other hand, here in this project, we decided to use uh, blue color which uh, stimulates our sense of concentration, our creativity. So it's perfect, especially right now, uh, where uh, we spend the majority of our times from at homes, we work from our homes, and uh, it's not only our place of, uh, of uh, living, but also of working. So the concentration is uh, necessary. But let's get back to, 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 to um, let's get back to taste because uh, that's another example on uh, how we can use architectural design to connote taste in markets. So curvature is associated with sweetness, while angular symmetrical shapes correspond to a salty or bitter taste instead. Okay, so what can we do now? Our world uh, and the problem of the contemporary world uh, are the conflicts and different kinds of diversities. Uh, so people are losing their ability to communicate and the emotions are moving to the virtual world and the real senses disappear. So I think that we, as uh, an architects and by our projects, we should encourage people to see, to listen and to feel. So architecture should animate people to stimulate uh, more than only the one sense that uh, is usually uh, used. So not only I, not only the view, but all the other senses, because in fact, we are all the same. So no matter what age we are, what kind of disabilities we have, uh, our brains, uh, our brains are multisensory. So that's another quotation by Yuhani Palazma. Uh, that every, signify, every significant experience of architecture is multisensory. Qualities of matter, space, and scale are measured by the eye. Nose, skin, tongue, skeleton, and muscle. But how to do it? So there are three uh, ways of uh, multisensory integration. It's sensory dominance, super additivity, and sub additivity. So I will explain you briefly what does it mean and uh, how it works? So let's start with the sensory domination. Uh, it means that uh, one sense, for example, in, uh, the eye, is much stronger than uh, the other ones. So there was an experiment that one expert were given uh, white wine um, with a red food dye inside, 
and uh, they were tricked because they thought that in fact uh, they are drinking red wine but it was only a white wine in uh, in uh, with red food dye so that's an example how the sense of uh, of, of sight dominated um, the sense of uh, taste and here you can see two charts it's uh, super additivity and sub additivity so um, super additiv additivity is uh, when two of our senses are congruent so um, two uh, senses uh, that are not so strong can give uh, strong effects when uh, they are working together so i will give you an example if you are wearing glasses and uh, you put your glasses on when you are in a noisy environment or in a noisy cocktail party you can hear better than without that. Uh, if you are wearing glasses, you can check it uh, after the symposium and believe me, it will work in such a way. But on the other hand, we have uh, also sub-additivity and it uh, means, uh, it means uh, something else. Uh, it means, uh, it means that, uh, it means that uh, if you have two senses, but they are not congruent, so one sense is uh, stronger than the other one, uh, the sum of its senses can be less, uh, can be much smaller than uh, this one sense that we had at the beginning. So, if you want an example, it could be a badly dubbed uh, film in the cinema when you can't hear better because of the bad uh, dubbing. So, what we should do is uh, what we should do is uh, to reach super our super additivity in uh, in our in our car architecture. Because, for example, if you design a shop where alerting music is combined uh, with uh, relaxing scent. So believe me that the, the size will, will, will uh, decline. So super additivity is the most desirable one. And once again, we come back to Le Corbusier because the field of synesthetic design has grown rapidly in recent years, but uh, Le Corbusier was already experimenting with it many years ago, 50 years ago. So once again, together with Yanis Xenakis, he designed the Philips Pavilion for the Expo 58 in Brussels. And when Philips uh, asked him to design this pavilion, he answered them, I will not make a pavilion for you, but an electronic poem and a vessel containing the poem, light, color, image, wind, and sun joined together in an organic synthesis. So he cooperated with composers, with artists, and many more uh, people representing multidisciplines to create this, this building and that's how it uh, works. So the concept was that the audience members would enter the building in groups of 500 in 10 minutes intervals. So when they get in uh, for two minutes, they feel in through this uh, curved corridor, this curved passageway. And at that time, they hear Xenaki's uh, transitional piece of music. Then they enter a room that would go into darkness and the audience is enveloped in a space of light and sound for eight minutes. At the same time, an accompanying video displays images along the walls of the pavilions. And uh, at the end of the eight minutes piece, the spectators would exit while the next group uh, enters. So what Le Corbusier did here was a preview of synesthetic design. Uh, he based his decisions on surprising connections between the senses that we all share. So for example, between high pitched sounds and small, light, fast moving objects. And here you can see a contemporary example from London. So perhaps you can, you can uh, uh, some of you perhaps had uh, already been there. So that's Ecology Gallery from the National Museum in London. And um, here we can see uh, two bridges that um, but uh, in the entire project, we have four bridges. And uh, here you can see two of them. Uh, the left one is covered by glass and the right one is covered uh, with wood. The other ones are covered with metal and uh, recycled rubber tires. And when one crosses the, across the bridge, it produces varying sounds and sensations underfoot, stimulated, uh, st stimulating our senses of hearing and touch. And only this double cherry wood handrail runs throughout the entire exhibition, providing a tactile constant in the series of changing visual environments. 
And in the end, I would like to present you my own uh, vision of synesthetic design and on how can we use it uh, to improve the quality of life of our cities. So that's an example from Warsaw, that's the capital of Poland. And uh, the city of Warsaw is uh, divided into two parts by the river of Vistula. But uh, the river could also work uh, as a connecting factor of the city, not a divining one. And here, uh, that's the main, uh, the most important bridge of Warsaw, the Poniatowski Bridge, which currently is a very unpleasant space because it's full of cars, it's noisy, but in fact, it could be uh, a pleasant a green space um, that uh, integrates people from different social and cultural groups. So that's how we do it. We divided, uh, we divided, uh, we divided uh, the bridge into five uh, into five parts, and each part uh, is uh, is dedicated for one uh, for one sense. Uh, so I did this project together with my friend uh, Paulina Boruch, and uh, we invite you to the walk uh, through across the bridge. So we start uh, under the bridge with smell and with taste. And currently, under the bridge, uh, there are full of cars and uh, rubbish bins. But this space could look like in such a way that there, there could be uh, markets with herbs, with vegetables that uh, relates to our sense of taste. But there could also be some um, urban farming that relates to our senses of uh, our sense of uh, smell. So then we move forward. We have uh, the space of uh, touch. And uh, here we designed some touching installations, for example, uh, some tactile installations. So you can see here uh, an example that you can see a blind person that can see using uh, his sense of touch. Also, uh, next we have the zone of hearing. So we, here we suggested uh, some music toys or uh, a stage because currently this bridge is full of cars, it's noisy, it's extremely unpleasant space. So um, there is a very nice, very a, a beautiful river, but you can't enjoy that because you can hear only very noisy cars. So on the other hand, uh, we could have uh, some musical toys there uh, stimulating our sense of, of, of hearing. And the last zone is dedicated for the eye. So we suggested there's some, uh, some, some lighting uh, installations that are just in front of the river. So that's an example is that uh, thanks to mixing all the senses, uh, we can create a happy space, integrating all the inhabitants, no matter what age they are, no matter where they come from, and no matter what type of disability they have. So to sum up, I think that today it seems unrealistic that uh, the dominance of the visual will be challenged anytime soon. But what we should do as architects is to adopt a more multisensory perspective. So by designing experiences that uh, engage more of the senses in a congruent manner, it will create more engaging and memorable architecture and increase the quality of life. So uh, that was just a brief introduction of uh, designing for all the senses. But uh, if you would like to learn more um, about, about us, uh, I encourage you to contact us via our social media. It's a master's architecture where we promote the best architecture in the world, uh, also by my private uh, profile. So once again, thank you very much for, 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 for watching. Thank you so, so much, Wojtek. Um... I, we need to say we've been just uh, writing and discussing a, a little bit uh, about your presentation when you are presenting and what we think that it neatly presents a complexity of our perception of architecture and maybe that uh, it includes also the senses that we don't think about, yeah? And yeah, exactly, we, that's it. Yeah, so we, we think that it, and it's really interesting that you showed also the theory to us uh, be behind all of this, because this is how we can maybe understand it better, or maybe we can include it uh, also with some theory behind it. And we think also that it may be become a really good foundation for further exploration of the cities of our surroundings, su such as Milton Keynes. Yes, to improve the quality of life, because... Uh... Yeah. 
usually it's not only the problem of architects, but also from all the other disciplines. When we are architects, we usually uh, talk only to other architects. But also when we have lawyers, they usually talk only with lawyers. When we have um, doctors um, of medicine, they talk only with other doctors of medicine. So our perception should be more interdisciplinary. For example, if you, if you, design, if you design a library, uh, it's not only for uh, the it's not only for uh, the architect and for the owner of the library, but uh, it's uh, for all the people who will come there. It's for politicians, it's for grandmothers, it's for uh, disabled, um, so for everyone from, uh, for, from from the social groups because each voice and is important. So that's why mm -hmm. we should hear more voices than only voice of the architect and client because we design for everyone and also. Uh, very important what the neurobiologist says. And according to what they say, our brain is absolutely multisensory. It's not only dominated in one sense, which is an eye, but it, uh, the, all our five senses are equal. And our architecture can be much better if we will design for all the senses and think about that, and uh, not only for one. Because imagine how much we lose because of designing for one sense only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I t t totally agree, and I think that uh, our next guest speaker uh, may talk about um, the advantages and disadvantages of looking um, at them in Milton Keys, uh, as I said, in city, a city, a small village actually, uh, located close to Coventry, uh, and he's an architect, urban designer, and creative advisor um, at David Locke Associates. However, his career is spread to places like London Docklands or West Midlands. But it needs to be said that Will uh, would probably be able to present his stance without the preparation. And this is what he did uh, when we were talking a few, few weeks uh, ago. However, when you include this quality time of reflecting on the space surrounding him, it may, um, you know, you may have the results that you will see in the moment. And let me introduce Will Cousins from David Locke Associates, United Kingdom. Thank you for being with us. Yep. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, um, I think what I'll do, if I may, immediately, is just see if I can share my, uh, my screen. And uh, let's see if we can do that. OK, can you see that? Yes, yes, we see. Okay. So, um, I'm not entirely sure whether your, um, your view is getting, I'm, I'm getting the view of the panel as well, but can you can just see the screen without, without that? Yes, we see the screen without the panel. Okay. So it's just perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so partly, uh, today, I'm going to take you on a, a little bit of a journey through um, uh, recent history, because I think the history is important in terms of setting the context for what it is that we, um, uh, are the conclusions we're reaching about a, 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 the new city of Milton Keynes, where I live and work, and have worked for, um, uh, on and off now for the best part of 40 years, in one capacity or another. Um, and the important part, I think, um, where Milton Keynes is at the moment as a new city is the taking the opportunity to kind of review and assess um, where, it's, where its future lies. And this word towards a healthy architecture, I think, is taking us in a direction towards asking the question about um, how we uh, now establish um, a, a healthy uh, framework for the growth of the further growth of the city. Um, Part of the um, questions I think that are, we're asking ourselves at the moment through the, uh, the pandemic is that it's really, um, I think, proposed, uh, I think, an MRI scan of a city's health. Um, as practitioners uh, and professionals in, in uh, the busy process of uh, engaging process of, of making a city, um, it's, it's not often that our assumptions and uh, beliefs are so fundamentally challenged by something that's affecting um, uh, uh, the globe at the moment. And one of those things, one of the analogies, I think, is that it's uh, with all of the hardship and the, and the enormous challenge it's bringing, 
is whether we are now able to kind of question ourselves about well, some of the assumptions that have been built into, into city making. An image of the city of Milton Keynes as it is today, is, is, here is a view of the patient, shows an urban form that is this. It does that constitute in many respects the, the basis of a, of a healthy city? And if so, um, what is it about it that we can either use in going forward, uh, both for Milton Keynes or for other places, or what other things do we need to reflect on and, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, and review? And one characteristic of a project that um, has a lifespan so far of, of over 50 years, it takes the opportunity um, appropriately from time to time to review that. So I think one of the characteristics we would agree on maybe is that the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated existing trends in, in many respects. And we talk about how people use uh, cities, um, but it's also establishing new trends in city making. Um, but the idea of building a healthy city has been a, been, been a preoccupation for city builders for millennia. Um, and I'm not going to go back that far to take us through, otherwise we, would have, we wouldn't have um, sufficient time for that. But I think it's important that we need to understand that also um, new trends are challenging the received wisdom of what makes a great place uh, to live and work. So if I start my journey on this, from Milton Keynes' point of view, in um, the, something you'll all be familiar with, I, I'm, I'm sure, in terms of uh, urban history, is the Garden City movement. And um, putting aside the kind of notion of um, uh, the kind of form and the, and, and, the, and the urban typologies that run from uh, Ebenezer Howe's thinking, um, it was very much a reaction to health um, about the nature of health, healthier uh, surroundings in a reaction to um, the conditions that uh, many in the United Kingdom found themselves in and across Europe in, in that uh, Victorian age, that uh, post 19th century, early 20th century age about whether or not we were uh, creating cities that were fit for purpose. And Letchworth with his first city um, brought together this idea um, a utopian idea of bringing together the best of town and country. Um, and I've been in over the years when we've been thinking about this, it, it, it stimulates fierce debate about whether or not that, uh, those characteristics um, can be found together. But what Howard was talking about um, in this uh, idea of the three magnets had these wonderful kind of notions uh, about pure air and water, plenty to do, you know, activity, freedom uh, and uh, fields and parks. So, so things we take as, maybe as uh, granted, but actually some things that through the pandemic we've learned, uh, I think importantly to know how, how important they are in terms of uh, people's overall uh, physical and mental well-being. So that idea was taken forward. Um, it was taken forward in a very bold way by uh, in a post-war period in, in the United Kingdom. Um, where the government, for a whole range of reasons, both in terms of the quality of existing cities and housing, uh, the need to build a, to begin a build an economy, um, it went uh, and uh, passed an act of parliament, which formed the basis for the uh, formation of the New Towns movement. Um, and I know these, these were running in parallel across Europe and across uh, North America and other parts of the country in terms of uh, how, we, how people uh, set about creating uh, and building new cities. Um, but in this interesting quote, I like from Lewis Silkin, who was the Minister of Town and had this notion, um, maybe you know, slightly um, uh, old fashioned in its sense now, but at least it, what it was looking at was talking about health um, and about the way in which uh, self-respecting dignified person uh, could live with a sense of beauty, culture and civic pride. Uh, it's sometimes extremely difficult to translate those into a modern uh, vocabulary, um, but they sometimes also got, get lost or, or are, um, are forgotten about at times when we're starting to bring some of those qualities together. So um, the, the last of those, 90, those 32 new towns was Milton Keynes. Um, and a, a little geography lesson for those that aren't familiar. I should have put, well, Coventry is on the map, so you know where it is. Um, but it started off uh, as a location in North Buckinghamshire um, with a, a relatively uh, modest existing population based upon villages and small towns. So it existed, but it also, I think in terms of its economic success, 
um, which is a, is, is, a, is a constant area of fascination for a lot of people who visit from overseas to see how does a project like this actually be successful. The location was clearly um, significant in underpinning success, but it was how it was made. Um, so the, the master plan for uh, the, the city published in 1970, soon, soon after its designation, um, had these goals. No mention in there about health explicitly, but this idea of opportunity, freedom, and choice, which I think in terms of people's well-being at the moment, it seems to me to be one of the critical aspects of it. Um, and this idea of attractiveness and about awareness um, and about the pro-social uh, aspect, the involvement of people in the making of it, albeit in the, given to the hands of a, um, an organization uh, formed by the central government and to operate uh, in, a, and I sometimes like to describe as a sort of a benign totally, uh, totalitarian way to actually build a city. The images on the, four, on the other side there really indicate the choices that were being debated there about whether the city form, which obviously had a major, will have and did have a major effect on its ultimate um, uh, success, was, was a sort of simplicity about the, the choices of a radial or a grid city. The grid city form was chosen. Um, I'm never quite sure about where the depth of the debate was held on that, but it was. Um, and that, in one sense, set the city off on its path. Um, significant at that time that they would be confident that they could deliver a, a, pro a project over 22,000 acres or nearly 9,000 hectares and a population of 250,000, but that has been achieved. Um, and those elements in there uh, were rudimentary basic sort of planning uh, instruments. And of course, in terms of setting the scene for the success, uh, a response to its uh, existing topography, heritage, transportation corridor, which formed the basis of something I'll come back to, which was this idea in this garden, this, this new garden city or new town, that uh, public open space would pay a, play a predominant part in the quality of the lives of the residents that would move there. Um, and the urban forms and the uh, landscape forms, um, which, uh, meticulously followed that grid, uh, the ones that were laid out and, and developed. And a, an image I always like to put up by the uh, architect illustrator uh, Helmut Jacobi was to show that this is, was a picture in 1970 of what that city might be. Um, influenced un, undeniably by Mies and the modernist movement because this is not a folksy view of Britain. Um, it gets attributed to having more uh, associations with Los Angeles, but I've never quite quite made that connection across. We can see some parallels, um, but in a in a, a with the benefit of Google Earth these days, this is the kind of form that has been developed. Um, but importantly, as well, you know that it's the city like that grows both in terms of its land use and its form. But in this uh, little sequence here, you can show that rapid urbanization took place in the 70s and 80s. That was partly to do with the way in which it was controlled and invested in by central government. Um, but also um, it was a, in one sense an endorsement of its then social, economic uh, and political uh, success. Um, its economic success was one that um, underpinned the fact that that choice of location, the propensity for people were not made to move here. There was a choice and in moving to a place, um, they made the, that pattern of growth. Um, and one of the aspects of the pattern of growth, of course, is to it, it, on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen is the nature of the catchment, the ability to grow a place that had within it uh, both work and of course, in any new project, um, because this, seemed that this was the currency of new cities, was a retail um, function that people would not be able to get elsewhere that that um, purple, the 90 uh, minute drive time meant that um, it was not uncommon for people to choose to come to Milton Keynes from, um, from Coventry uh, by virtue of the fact what, of what it offered. But the other image there, I think most telling now when we're 50 years on was that um, when one then analyzes the city and its health, both as a sort of physical form and indeed the residents in it, you then see um, a, a growing concern about uh, the indices of uh, multiple de deprivation across the city, perhaps understandably and predictably uh, associated with those areas that were built 
in those early 1970s period, which were largely public sector housing um, and had largely then been, uh, had not uh, received any uh, conscious inward investment uh, in them uh, in that intervening period. And that is an agenda that is now to the fore of the city about the health of the city in terms of its, both its, its fabric, but also the, 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 the population and the citizens that live there. So the city hardware is uh, important, but it actually needs software as well. And one of the interesting characteristics of a Milton Keynes that we have is that it, um, it developed um, uniquely the notion of a community foundation. Well, the community foundation, of course, um, is one which uh, is, is explicitly about dealing with the, um, uh, the, the, the residents' uh, aims and uh, um, uh, understanding. And what that uh, community foundation does, or has been doing over the last um, 20 years or so, is carrying out analysis of the city in terms of its, its vital signs. And those vital signs are ones where we, it's, it's whatever the physical fabric is showing, um, we are to be able to survey and understand the, um, the health and well-being of, uh, of, of the citizens. Um, but another aspect of a growing a city was the creation of a trust. So the value that was being placed in this um, green space um, would have been nothing if it had not had the long-term legacy of being given a 999-year lease to a trust whose sole purpose was to manage, maintain, and promote that green space for the a benefit of the citizens of the new city um, and their objective um, and they are well funded because they were funded with a dowry when set up and those investments continue is to continue to make sure that the uh, stewardship of the space uh, and its activation uh, is aligned to the uh, requirements and the growth of a new, new city. So uh, bringing us up to date, the question about whether the Milton Keynes in many respects um, had been moving towards a health um, came up in some degree with a piece of new work that I was involved in, my company was involved in um, on behalf of the council, which was to look at the strategic growth study. So what out, what out of these um, ambitions, and most of them are driven and very much driven by uh, political ambition, of course, um, cities now, there's no longer a development corporation planning and building it. It, is, it runs itself in this, as a unitary authority, which uh, those of you know the UK planning and uh, political system will mean that it, 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 it deals with all matter of transport, health, uh, and development and growth. Um, and our strategy for the city was one which I think was one that uh, certainly needed to take cognizance of where we'd been, but where we might be going. I'm just putting these two up, and of course you'll recognize them as well as students of Jan Gale. Um, that Jan was very influential, I think, in many respects in, 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 in predicting and understanding that, you know, city growth and change um, is very much um, predicated both on quality, but also changing economic and social patterns. And this, this is no, uh, and Milton Keynes is no exception in this. Um, so the quality of what, what is there, the fact that uh, the the, the, the planners of the 1970s thought that the centre of Milton Keynes was a, a retail and a business function. Those questions have now been brought into stark relief and whether they are valid today. Um, but equally, the place quality criteria that we're playing to them, what are the qualities that we've, um, uh, we've been left with in those recent years? And what are the um, diagnostic metrics that we can begin to bring in? In parallel with that, maybe partly in the UK's realisation that some places are suffering more than others. Um, we've been involved uh, in some of the projects that I've been involved outside Milton Keynes as some of the demonstrator sites about uh, healthy cities. And um, this is a subject presentation on its own where, the, where here you're seeing the National Health Service realising that um, health is different from illness and um, working its way through uh, the right sort of design criteria, some which will be very familiar to you, but they're very valid to understanding this. So bringing us back to Milton Keynes, where we are, where we've been going, um, this diagram, and it's no more than a diagram at the moment, begins to understand the strategy. Um, and you will see with a, with a city of its form, it's, it's finding two things. One, the intensification of its existing urban form, um, most and regeneration around its sort of spine where um, those early sites uh, both need the direct invent intervention in, in their fabric and in the ghost communities, 
but also areas of growth. And some of those um, at this scale are to do with mobility shifts. Uh, again, those mobility shifts are about, um, let's go back to that, um, taking people to and from and asking the question, what is the changing role of the city centre? This plan is a typical land use plan showing the idea that you know, city centre has retail and business at its heart. But what we're seeing in recent months is a suggestion that that may not necessarily be the pattern that sustains Milton Keynes growth. And central Milton Keynes, whilst it's seen as a city centre, actually has always been conceived as a local centre, district centre, a city centre and this sub-regional centre that will draw people in from Coventry. Whether or not that those latter scales will function, I think remains to be seen, but we are now looking at different ways. But the city centre has always been, and another Jacobi image, and I love this for its virtue, it has my two heroes, Jimi Hendrix and, uh, um, a, uh, and, and a facsimile of Frank Zappa on it. Those ideas that we, the city is actually a place of choice and it's optional, and it is a place where people can choose to meet under whatever uh, social, um, that has been taken forward with other work I've been doing with um, Milton Keynes Gallery in growing that as, and, and thinking about City Club as not a, a single building, but the whole of the city centre. And that city centre kind of form that you saw from the 70s um, equally related not just to that central area of um, commercial districts, offices, retail, uh, and some civic uses, but importantly to the uh, hinterland of residential areas around them. Two areas from the study that I just want to touch on very quickly. One is the nature of active mobility. Milton Keynes is known for its cycleway system. It's very good in many respects, but ultimately what the COVID is, uh, uh, pandemic has demonstrated is that it actually is um, not fit for purpose. And what we've been doing through this strategy to say, well, maybe we need another um, investment in infrastructure to retrofit that, that city structure in a way that was closer to some of the original objectives, but upgraded, that starts to think about central Milton Keynes as being a 15 minute city for a cyclist. So the city area uh, on that cycle network, which is much of which is in place, but you know, as with all systems, it's, it's, it's only as strong as its weakest link, um, dealing with those links to improve it. Importantly, the green estate that runs right across the city, but importantly in city centre itself. Um, what happens when this is Midsummer Boulevard on in August last year, in the middle of the week? These are offices underutilised and car parking space, 20,000 car parking spaces. Big question, big challenge. Um, maybe we can start to think, and here's a picture of Eindhoven where I am fortunate to visit. Maybe we start to think about repurposing some of that infrastructure and what is redefining that role of infrastructure about. We can only do that with the support and the involvement of that community. So um, where we've learned that, I think the city probably began a process of, um, if not explicitly, implicitly wanting to create a place where people felt well and healthy. Um, some of those objectives have been met. We've, we've now reached a moment, I think, um, I want to use the word a crossroads, but a fork in the road about how we begin to uh, invest and retrofit the city so that um, you know through good stewardship um, that and the involvement of the community through the strategy we'll be able to adapt um, and provide the city with the forms and the places that it will need uh, to take it to the next 50 years so thank you for that and I will now stop my share That was about 20 minutes, I think. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your detailed presentation. Um, I think the way you introduced the example of Milton Keys um, explained us really well the realities of British urbanism. Um, as you said that um, some uh, urban projects um, had a health um, as aim in their programs, we can we can never say to what extent it is useful right now. We can never foresee uh, what's going what's going to be in, in the world, right? We can never uh, know how much it will help our communities, I think. Um, so I think it is really crucial to reflect on the good and bad aspects of our surroundings. Um, as with them, we are able to uh, focus on the urban 
urbanism that um, sustains a healthy community, right? Okay. Um, so thank you I mean, I'll we'll come to questions later, but maybe we take the next uh, next speaker. But I think some of those lessons, I think, are are, yes. are, are eternal. They're they're around ev and on every situation, everywhere, and everyone has to confront those. And um, sometimes the city building is considered to be a laboratory that allows it to be to experiment one way or another. But um, you do do experimentations uh, at your peril. But we can talk about that. Of course, so we'll answer, um, we'll ask all the questions at the end um, during the discussion panel. So your conclusions uh, regarding the living spaces on the bigger scale are a great base to move on um, to a human scale in the next presentation. Our next guest um, is an extremely hardworking person, um, except from collating masters of architecture. She has an experience in working in practice and writing. Um, thus, her reflections are always well considered and on point. Um, today, she's going to talk about doubts that led to a research of interdependence of natural and artificial factors influencing actions of human or human being. So we would like to introduce you, um, Justina Bodu. Um, hello, hello uh, everyone. Um, I invite you to my theoretical lecture. Uh, this is something like manifesto uh, because the lecture aims to provoke uh, a look at the human world and architecture from a different uh, perspective. So give me a second. I have to share my screen. Mm. Wait, wait. Okay. We see it just in case. So we can uh, we can start. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, I would like to present the famous print uh, of unknown author published by French astronomer Camille uh, Flammarion. He showed uh, why he got to the border of the world and was delighting himself on the view of the universe while looking beyond the Earth sphere. The wanderer sees more. On the other hand, uh, a well-known image of a static Virtuvian man created by Leonardo as the measure of the word uh, at the human. The word is small. The COVID situation uh, make us aware of finitude and the change the scale of the word in my mind in our consciousness. The fact how quickly the pandemic uh, has uh, spread emphasized interpersonal relationship, uh, globa globalization, and the issue of uh, our distance. Our independence is turning into interdependence. Human organism interact with the other organism in the development and functioning. Thanks to arrangements of biology and medicine, starting from disruptive ideas Lynn Margulis, according to which the driver of evolution and creation of new species was symbiosis and combining of uh, organisms. We are rather a collective uh, being and, uh, and the uh, total of interactions. Biology, natural selection, uh, all life in uh, connected and related to each other. And this uh, diversity of life is a product of modification of population by natural selection, where some traits were uh, favored in an environment over others. 
Uh, and uh, for the first time uh, in history in this period, uh, we perceive our planetary place as complete and limited, Fra fragile and prone uh, to destruction. What is human production gets to Earth? What surrounds us is part of us. It's a closed circle. What do we want to be shaped of? Uh, architecture exists in a complex network of uh, resources and energy flows, a material ecology. Uh, in a circular economy, how could we design a completely uh, recyclable building? How do we recycle a building or materials in a way that we could really benefit from? Uh, throughout their life cycle, from conception to Disassembly buildings affect natural and cultural ecologies at regional and uh, and the global scales. This is a picture where uh, um, architect use uh, material ecologies philosophy and natural materials inside. Uh, and uh, looking uh, back on traditional uh, constructions. Old timber houses were often moved, so it should be possible with more natural materials such as brick, wood, uh, and uh, glass. Life cycle uh, assessment methods can measure this material and energy flow uh, inherited to the building. Long uh, lived buildings reduce to shared of uh, binded resources and environmental impact burned by each generation that inhabits them, uh, making durability at imp uh, imperative of uh, sustainability. And uh, for in, in my mind, uh, this is the uh, future. Uh, in a recent project, uh, Nari Oxmant, uh, used cheating, a uh, biological material found in the um, exoskeleton uh, of crabs, uh, butterflies, and uh, the like, uh, to answer the question, what would design be like if objects were made of a single part? Would we return a better state of creation? And... Uh, thinking about materials uh, as a dynamic system alive with their properties and at the same uh, time respond, uh, response, uh, responding to uh, our needs. Uh, is the future to Neri Oxman and her uh, lab uh, imagine? So, uh, if architects can involve uh, our way of selecting materials to a place of natura naturally aware design, perhaps we can arrive uh, at more um, insightful solutions for our building. Uh, one of my first uh, architectural uh, impression uh, of COVID, of COVID was uh, was uh, a client. Uh, who asked me for a house and uh, greenhouse uh, design. Uh, the greenhouse uh, is to serve a food production um, in, in times uh, of the COVID crisis. And uh, the house uh, is designed uh, with natural local materials, also using solar panels uh, and uh, and uh, promote the idea uh, using plants to be introduced as a permanent element uh, in design and in our future uh, project. Uh, because uh, I wonder, I wonder if uh, in this case, the additional function that should always appear in our project uh, is green and uh, a room where we can produce, for example, food 
um, uh, in, in small amounts. This uh, would uh, perhaps minimize, minimize uh, the great uh, production uh, of food. Uh, both the words and architecture seem uh, to be finished within our minds. Uh, it is within the limits of our mind. Uh, it is important to look at the building of uh, well-known architecture companies where the form, uh, thanks to computerization, uh, is uh, no longer an uh, obs uh, obstacle. So it's hard to talk uh, about uh, evolution uh, and predict the future. I believe uh, that uh, evolution in uh, materials building, um, however, uh, uh, in the materials from which we create objects. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank, thank you so much, Justina. Um, so from what I noticed is, uh, again, the idea of this interdisciplinarity uh, between different purviews, between different different professions uh, that you, you, Justina, said, and also Wojciech said, and also uh, some way in the presentation of uh, Will, it was visible. And that's really, really interesting. And, uh, and additionally, uh, what seems to be a really interesting factor affecting our, ourselves uh, in terms of physical and mental states um, might be interactions between people, uh, in, in my opinion, and the opinion also of our next guest speaker. And this man is really determined and broad-minded. Uh, and I think he may give us solutions to the problems that you were mentioning, that Le Corbusier was mentioning, and also uh, that he will, he will mention, and which is the interactions between people. And Juan Carlos Romero was raised in Colombia, studied in Delft, and became a professional in Turin. Um, in the last destination, uh, Juan works for Carlo Ratti Associati, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, which office are located in Italy and in New York. Uh, they had the pleasure to collaborate with the studios such as Bjarke Ingels Group, redefining standards uh, and ways of living in the new sky skyscrapers in for example singapore and their idea and their solutions to the uh, problem of interactions between people are very often solved by intersection between digital and physical sp spaces and i think juan may present to us a small anticipation of what the future may look like and uh, thanks to the research that they have done in terms of COVID and in in terms of uh, numerous buildings that uh, Carlo Ratti Society designed. Juan, thank you for being here. And it's a great honor and floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the introduction. Um, as, um, as Alexander was saying, I um, have been going a little bit around the world and uh, I'm now in Italy working with, with, uh, with Carlo Ratti Society as <laughs> it, was, it was almost there. Um, and just to give you a, a big idea of what I do here, or a rough idea of what I do here, I work uh, for what it's called the, the future team or the strategy and innovation team. And we're looking for uh, all the new projects that, uh, that the studio does and all the, let's say, the research that, um, that lead us to, to, to new opportunities. And I think this is very connected to uh, what I'm going to talk about to you uh, now. Uh, let me try and share my screen while I tell you this and see if it works. Mm, you tell me when you when you are able to see it, please. Yes, we see it. Great. So um, what I'm trying to try, what I'm going to do now is try to tell you a little bit about let's say teasers of what uh, of what the future might look like. It's uh, something that is related to the research that we have been doing here uh, at the studio or that uh, we have been doing also with Carlo at the MIT and tell you a little bit about also some of, of my thoughts if, if, if time uh, is, 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 is still permitting uh, about 
some thoughts that I had about policy making that could be the way into action of some of these things at a broader scale, let's say, or, or at a city scale. So when, uh, when we first talked with Alexander, he told me about this towards healthy architecture subject and about all the things that we had put in, in, in doubt after the pandemic. And I think, uh, well, in general, uh, a good way to, to, to start is to see what happened last year and to see what, uh, what were the new things. So I think the most shocking thing that we, that we saw in the past, in the past few months uh, was for sure uh, seeing places that we always thought of, like the heart of people uh, getting together, such as uh, Times Square, as you see here, but uh, let's say a local example, the Navigli in Milan, or what you would see, uh, let's say, in the heart of London, um, in, in the heart of Paris, in Madrid, everywhere around the world. That is a lot of people coming together. Suddenly, all these spaces were without a soul. And you would see images like these that you hadn't seen in years or maybe um, in, in decades or, or so on and so forth. Mm. The same thing uh, we could say about the way that we start living our lives. So start connecting through Zoom, start connecting through uh, all the digital platforms, uh, being at home, reevaluating all the spaces where we, where we um, let's say, carry out our, our day-to-day -day life. Um, but I think we need to go back to, to what a pandemic can be and what, a, what the cities mean in the, in the middle of this, of this whole discussion. We have had times like this before, and we have uh, seen that uh, the city has always been uh, the center of, uh, of, uh, of, let's say, human interactions. In the past, or like um, in, in the moments where we have had a pandemic and where we thought that this would change the way that we, that we use uh, urban spaces, we have seen time after time uh, that the urban, um, agglomerations uh, have prevailed and that the will of people to meet and to come together again there it's stronger than uh, say the the events that might that might bring them apart if we think about venice after the plague it was the moment in which uh, it became stronger and perhaps not only because it was a strong naval uh, let's say power but also because it was a place where a lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of uh, intellectuals were coming together. It was also a place that boomed after, after the plague. So if we think about that, we can also see that the cities nowadays, they're not going to change. Uh, I don't think that the, um, let's say, exodus from the city to the, to the countryside will be a trend. I think that after this, and thinking about how we can make it better, the city will come out stronger. And the way that we meet with people will be uh, more important than, than ever. To think about cities, I would like you to, to remember these four numbers. I think they're the four no key numbers that you need to know when you think about this, this situation with cities. Um, 250, 75, and 80. So cities cover 2% of the, of, the of the Earth's surface. They host more than 50% of the, of the population. This is a, st a measure from 2008, and that it's uh, going to arrive up to, up to 70% in uh, the next 20 years, probably, uh, with uh, United Nations calculations. It um, consumes 70% uh, percent of, the, of, the, of the world energy, and it produces 80% of the um, CO2 emissions. So if we think about this, we can see that a small part of the of the Earth's surface is uh, very important to the way that we live our lives. So, I just want you to remember these four numbers uh, as we as we discuss about things that can happen in the city. An important thing that I want to tell, talk to you about as well is the way that we use the city and the way that we live in the city and how it has changed. So, if we think about some of the uh, let's say, important people that we, that we talked about before. So uh, Le Corbusier, for example, in the moment in which uh, we were thinking about um, his uh, Ville Radios or some of these experiments about the city, there was a the thinking about zoning, about having live, work, play, all the different things were separated and with a specific place. We think about what Jane Jacobs did in the 60s and about mixing of, of these uses. 
And what we can see today is that technology has allowed us to have a mix of this all together. Um, and networking has allowed us to uh, start thinking about how, um, let's say, the different the different uh, spaces can be used for multiple for multiple uses. This being said, I want to talk to you about, uh, let's say, mainly two things. So it's um, about the way that we work. That I think that things that that had the biggest impact in the past in the past few months, and the way that we live. So I think I will start with a let's say a provocative question. That is. If work is digital, and especially how we have seen it in the latest um, in the latest months, why do we still go to the office? This is a, a, a question that we asked ourselves already uh, five years ago, uh, uh, with and we did some research about this at the MIT. And nowadays, we're also thinking about uh, some of the research that sociologists have done in the past thirty years. Let's say, most importantly, Granovetter uh, has been a, a a big exponent of this, and is what is the office offering that is not possible to find when we do these kind of events, for example, in Zoom. So in here, just to make you a brief introduction, he talks about what in your circle of connections, what in, in, in your circle of, of people that you know, are strong ties and which are weak ties. So basically strong ties are everything that uh, goes in your circle of friends, in your colleagues, people that you talk to frequently people that might create let's say what, what would be a, a, a resonance bubble or a resonance uh, circle around your thoughts that uh, make uh, ev everything that is your base of, of thinking uh, stronger so usually you choose your friends because they're people that agree with you and not because they're people that are challenging you constantly on your ideas while your weak ties are people that are acquaintances are people that you meet through um, uh, your social network uh, that might challenge this point of view. So in this sense, we're talking about uh, the people that you meet maybe at a party through a friend. So it's a friend of a friend that you would not, would not re uh, usually have the, the, the way to, to meet. And the thing that we, that we find the most important about these people is, that, is the people that actually will challenge the way that you believe and will help you uh, perhaps view certain problems in a different, in a different way. I will tell you a little bit about why we find this important uh, a, little bit, a little bit further on. So just to give you an idea of, 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 what, uh, of what these connections mean like, we did an analysis at that moment in which we would see how people would connect to each other and how people were um, interacting, having uh, the difference between in-person interactions and um, virtual interactions. So this is um, done all at the at the MIT campus, and what we see is that see, uh, through the analysis of the use of Wi-Fi, people were using Wi-Fi mostly at home during the night and then um, at the campus during the day. What is the what is the result of having an extended Wi-Fi network and extended uh, way of connecting to people that people can start uh, following lessons, for example, not uh, necessarily from the classroom, but also from from the park, from uh, let's say other uh, other spaces in the in the campus, and in this way activating what could be spaces of encounter with uh, with other people. I will show you a couple of examples about this this later on. And what we see in the office is a shift from what could be uh, like this uh, uh, an exaggerated example. This is uh, uh, Jack Tati's movie uh, in which everyone is is. Um, let's say trapped in their own in their own cubicle, and what we see today that is spaces more in the vein of uh, co-working spaces where people can meet, where people from different offices can meet and share their ideas. And we think that this is the important part. And with this, um, I would like to share uh, a little bit of an anecdote of why we think this this uh, let's say soft links or weak links are are, are important. If you think about a lot of research or a lot of anecdotes about people that have won important awards with the research, and, and uh, in particular, uh, you that are in Coventry or, or people that are following us from the UK, this is a very typical thing from the UK, UK in which people say that they were having problems with the research. They didn't know how to solve the problem that they were facing. 
And they met someone at a cafeteria and they realized that they were uh, approaching the problem in, in the wrong way. Someone uh, maybe shared an experience or told to or, or talked to them and told them like, you know what, maybe I see that problem in a different way. And they managed to solve a problem that they were having that they couldn't advance with. So what we call this is the cafeteria effect, the way of uh, having uh, an opportunity to have a new uh, point of view and solving, uh, solving an issue. In the long term, this is also a way for companies to um, improve the way that they do innovation. So if you're having people that only talk to the, to the, to the same group of people all the time and that uh, have a hard time connecting with, uh, with, with circles outside their, their, their usual, uh, let's say, their usual suspects, uh, this would also cause uh, a reduction in innovation. So we want people to be able to connect, to talk, to, 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 to do these all kinds of things, to share their experience in order to have new ideas to, to, to move forward faster. And this is where the, the, the office comes to play. So the office is not the place where you go to work because we have seen, especially now with the pandemic, that you can work from home very easily. But what you cannot do from home is connect to people, connect to random people, have this uh, moment in which you're drinking a coffee and you're sharing an idea and someone is telling you, I also have a great idea about it and develop something that will, let's say, make an impact or a bigger impact uh, or, or that, that what you can do from home. This is a little bit of, of, of what we did uh, in a project that we developed in, in well, this was 2019 and 2019 before, before the whole, the whole COVID uh, uh, crisis, but it had that idea uh, already inside it. So um, this is a, a, an office for a pharmaceutical uh, company in Milan that is all based around what we call activity-based uh, spaces. What is this? Um, is that basically we studied very hard what they did, what the way that they interact and the way that we could power these interactions in order to make them stronger and created a series of spaces that are um, let's say tailor-made in order to improve the interaction that they're having in, in the day-to-day. -day. Um, this is a couple of examples about that. So there are uh, small meeting rooms in which uh, people can solve problems very fast. So you can schedule them for half an hour or so to, to, to solve the, uh, a small issue. Um, this, is, this is more of the same, or uh, these uh, bigger spaces in which people can just come and solve a problem in five minutes or come, come to work there whenever they're feeling in the mood, for example, of having people uh, jumping in and having a conversation which uh, can help them uh, resolve a, a problem easier. There's a little bit more of, of, of this space. And as you can see, the whole idea is to um, create these spaces in which people can, can mingle, in which people perhaps from different um, departments or from uh, se sections of the office that wouldn't meet usually can meet and can uh, start uh, some of these random conversations that, uh, that I was talking to uh, before, that I was talking about before. This can go beyond the, the, the workspace. And as I was uh, mentioning before, a little bit uh, uh, about with the MIT, it's also something that we have explored in um, academic areas. So this is a project that we did for the um, University of Milan uh, that is now uh, building a new campus in the old expo area. So just to give you a brief introduction about this, the old expo area in Milan, the Expo 2015. It's an area that was due to, due to be uh, renovated or that is uh, part of a larger urban regeneration project uh, for which the innovation district of Milan is relocated to, to this area. We did also the master plan for that area. And a key part of, of, of building this space was not only having um, on one end the um, the, let's say what could be the typical innovation companies, pharmaceuticals and so on, but also bringing different kinds of, of, of players that could uh, enrich this, this system. So different ways of, of fostering this innovation and fostering this, these goals are not only creating spaces within companies, but larger spaces within uh, districts and city centers or city or city areas in which different kinds of people can meet. So the idea here was to bring 
university, one of the biggest hospitals in Milan is here. We also have um, a large quantity of startups that have set up their offices in the area just to uh, benefit from the innovation environment uh, that is uh, being, being proposed in this area. And in the middle of this, we have the uh, more scientific side of the University of Milan getting in. And what we tried to do here was to reinterpret the, the, their main idea, so, so their main core, uh, let's say, image that is this court building, this whole idea of the Italian university. So if you go back to the university in Bologna or the, also the university in Milan, in the center of Milan, they're all buildings all built around a court or a loggia. Um, in which people uh, have this space to meet in the corridors or in these big uh, green areas in the middle of the city. And we wanted to reinterpret this, not only within the campus, but also expanding the access to these areas to the people outside the campus. So this is a little bit of how it looks like. And this is a larger uh, view of the, of the master plan. So if you can see, uh, we start creating this series of inner corridors in which people can meet, but also some of them are uh, of public access. So people from, for example, the, the financial companies that work in the, in, the, in the area around it can also come to have lunch and that way maybe they can recruit their next, uh, their next um, interns uh, or they can share a, a research idea with some of the professors. So this is a little bit of the of the of the whole idea that that, that we that we want to um, bring forward in this in this kind of space this is very connected to the fact that um, at a larger uh, scale the city can begin to or can continue to 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 be this aggregator of innovation and this aggregator of great ideas so we are let's say activists for the city and we think that the way to uh, make the city work better for us is to uh, start making it, uh, let's say, a better place for the kind of interaction that we already have. So we start designing more for uh, the experience that the people have inside the city and not, and not the other way around. We'll try to adapt the people to an experience that we're designing. It's a little bit more about the, about the project. In this project, of course, we have some other uh, let's say architectural approaches with the facades with some of more let's say our typical uh, digital uh, plus physical approach more related to technology in which the facade is done with um, digital uh, manufacturing so we imagine that this uh, brick facade can be built by robots but this is part of a of a different discussion that i would be happy to 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 have in a in, a, in another moment and this is more of, of what it would look like, uh, some of these spaces. What, let's say just changing, changing completely the, the, the subject. Uh, I would like to talk about when we, when we stop working, when we stop studying, we <laughs> go back home. And in this sense, we think that the, um, the, the house is a key uh, element that we, that we need, or let's, let's say living spaces are key elements that we need to analyze in order to understand what could be uh, the way that, uh, that, uh, that we will be living in the future. So this is just a teaser. This is more of a, of a, of a let's say, explorative project that we, have, that, we, that we did in the past, in the past, um, in the past months, um, thinking about what could be and what are the important things in the living spaces. So I think, these are um, three uh, main issues that we see, and they're connected to, to, to what we have been discussing so far, but especially to what we saw happening in the time after, after COVID. So on one end, we saw we can, we can work at home, and uh, perhaps the home is still not ready to receive us as, 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 as workers. So we need to create spaces in, in, within our homes where we can perhaps work better. So this is one, one, of, the, one of, the, of the key uh, issues. The other one is that uh, the, the way that we saw people, for example, going out to London, trying to find a place that had more um, square meters, just to, to say it bluntly, or it happened a lot in Paris where people were living perhaps in a 25 uh, square meter or 30 square meter studio and wanted to be in a place where they could live better. So um, uh, this kind of 
willing uh, to, to reconnect with nature, to have a space that is less hard on the human being uh, that, that we correlate with, with biophilia. Um, so like this need of the human being of being close to nature and how we can have this interaction of nature and uh, the built environment within the city. And of course, everything that has to do with health. So the virus was the, a, a big problem. So what can we do to guarantee that we can go back to living the way that we were used to in a safer environment? So these are the three main subjects that we were, that we were thinking about. When we think about personal activities, of course, working is 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 one of the one of the of the main issues. So these are a little bit of different things that can start happening uh, at home. So how do we make spaces that can adapt to this uh, uh, in in different manners? So there's a little bit of what could a space in which you have uh, different areas, for example, a corner where you can study, a place where you can see and you have the good lighting to do all this that we're doing today so on and so forth. Um, how can we also uh, bring nature back? So this is a, a key issue because I think it's gonna be, we, we have been talking about sustainability a lot lately, but I think this is uh, gonna become a more practical issue of just saying, we're gonna have some plants inside, but how can this become part of, of our lives? So what if the plants are cleaning the air that we breathe? We have huge problems with air pollution all around the world. So this, this is gonna be something that is uh, clearly gonna gonna be part of architecture in the future in a in a more um, let's say practical way that is not only um, let's say made for for decoration or greenwashing um, also taking into account that urban farming is every time more and more present uh, uh, in the in the in the general political discussion and everything that can that we can do to make this a safe environment. So we think about, for example, UVC lights that can help, um, um, uh, let's say, make the make the air safer. Uh, how we can clean the clothes when we come back from the outside. How we can have materials that are safer than others, so on and so forth. And how we can integrate, for example, sensors into this whole mix. So because we all know that. Every space that we have, not only in, in our houses, but in our office, but also in our cities, are starting to become blanketed with sensors and with um, technology that are constantly monitoring and having a response to, to, to the things that we do. So we designed what could be a, a journey of a, of a place like this, or what a, a house that is adapting to all these things could look like. This is a very, very rough approach, but I wanted to share it with you just to just to get your ideas, just to tease you a little bit about uh, with the questions later on about what this could look like. So we think that construction in general will start to look a little bit more, um, uh, let's say, uh, it will look different of, of, of what it would look like. So it would be more based on modular and you will have a greater chance to um, say interact before the construction is happening or almost interact in real time with how the construction is happening customize it the way that you want. I think uh, one of the biggest uh, possibilities that, uh, that prefabricated uh, construction and all the new digital manufacturing technologies gives us is the possibility to also uh, personalize um, and customize everything that we're building. So this is something that we're already seeing happening with, with a lot of small gadgets or just, just thinking of, of, of small things that are already 3D printed. Um, the facility of, of building this uh, and uh, to connect all the all the all the different all the different uh, uh, let's say installations. But what we think it's really interesting about this is that the way that we live now, it's uh, very connected to the spaces that we have, and the way that we live changes frequently. So if we think about, uh, for example, a young couple that is expecting a kid or an, uh, a couple with a kid that is going to university and is uh, suddenly having a free room at their house. Um, all these different moments in which uh, people have changes in their lives and uh, in consequence need a change in space. Why is a real estate or the, 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 the space that we live, why are they adapting with us and why do we have to every time search for a new place? So 
what we think is that once we start building in this way and while we, once we start creating uh, a more uh, flexible system uh, of living and a personalized system of living, we can easily move this. So what if this uh, couple that uh, are sending their kid away for university, uh, what if they give away that room uh, to the couple next door that is having a kid and you can just move a wall and start having this, all these variations happening inside a building. So this is a little bit of what we can imagine that that, that can happen in this in this um, in this uh, let's say scenario. Or what happens if you move to a different country? Because definitely you have to. I mean, for example, uh, I mean I, I, I I'm the first to 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 have done that in 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 several times. What if I could just take my entire room with me and just rebuild it everywhere that I go. So there's a little bit of what we think that could happen with this. And of course, the possibilities go forward, go even further if you think about the fact that this can be done on a digital platform where you can start connecting with the people. Once you get to a new place, you know that there is a whole networking build with the neighborhood. You can start meeting people to share ideas, go to a bar to have a beer, have the cinema night that is happening in the in your neighborhood and in the end foster let's say a, 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 a better way of living of living the city of living the space that you that you're in this is a, an example that we did on 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 a completely different subject that is biophilia but this is something that i just wanted to 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 show you just to to gather uh, your feedback so we recently did, did, did this project for um, as part of the master plan we did for for Muti. Muti, I don't know if many of you know it, but it's um, um, a big factory that does uh, tomatoes and tomato sauce and everything that has to do with with food production uh, uh, here in Italy. So as, uh, as 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 you might have guessed, and a big part of this was the house of of, of Mr. Muti, that is the the owner of the of the of the of the company and he has this house in the middle of the of the same terrain where his factory is and we wanted to create this space that is the a reused uh, barn we wanted to recreate it into something that was connected to nature because this is in the middle of uh, of of what would be the the, the, the tomato production area in in, in Emilia Romagna here in Italy so the main idea behind this this project is to have this Ficus, that is the heart of the of the of the of the house, and all the life uh, starts to develop around it. So there's a little bit of we have this area that is in the middle of the green, but what if we also bring the green inside the house? And I think this connects really well to the idea that that Wojciech, uh, mentioned in the in the in the first in the first presentation of having the the the, the living garden, not the living room of the room garden. I, I think it's. It, it was something like that, right? Um, so I, I think we, we also were thinking about that of what if, if you have just the green inside and what, what are the spaces that can start to, to, to un, unfold around it. I'm not sure how, how is it going with time, so I'm not sure uh, how, how much time do I have left in, in general. Um, so you, Alexander, I'm not sure, like, it's, it's, five it's, okay, it's okay, you can keep going. Okay, great. And I think this, I'm gonna go really quickly about it because it's, uh, it's a little bit more about what happens at an urban scale. And some of the, of the ideas that we have been, um, let's say playing with at an urban scale. And I think the most important ones are what happens when you uh, start having automated vehicles that uh, start doing a lot of the things that you want to do. And this is an experiment that we're carrying out in Amsterdam with the, this is a, a project by the MIT with the Amsterdam uh, Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, in which we have these boats that are autonomous and that go around the canals. Um, and they could be the ones bringing you your Amazon package, uh, or they could be the ones bringing you Around the canals, when you when you need to go from one place to another, and perhaps the 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 the, the streets are to fill with bicycles, um, but most importantly, they could be the ones that create the new public space that we have need uh, in in specific moments. So, if you think about how we use public space, we use public space um, for large gatherings. Gatherings. Think about a square, for example. 
and how that square might be full in one moment and completely empty for uh, days to go after that. So what if we need to have a lot of people um, coming together at a, at a given moment and we create a space that is uh, used only for that one hour and then it disappears and it becomes something else. So what we wanted to, to, to start thinking about here is what if we can start having the city responding to the needs that we have. So this is a little bit why we uh, call it, we, we usually don't call it a smart city, but we call it a sensible city. And this is a little bit of a play on words because a sensible city has on one hand, the idea that there are sensors that are um, seeing what you're doing, but it's also sensible like a person. So it's also responding to the way that people uh, are living on it. So this is a, a little bit of what we could see that, 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 that might happen. So for example, what about the flower market that happens in the center of Amsterdam uh, in the morning? What if this is something that you see in the morning and then in the afternoon, the same boats can be used to build, um, for example, a bridge when uh, something is in construction work around it. So this is a little bit of, of what we thought. We thought about a bridge, so this was one of the experiments that we did, and we thought that if we put a bridge floating, probably the, the boats, the tourist boats couldn't pass. So our idea is that if we have the boats rotating in a circle, we can always have the space between the uh, autonomous boats that are rotating, uh, able for, for, the, for the other boats to pass by, so for the manned boats, uh, while you go from one place to another, for example. Or it can just be a water taxi. I think this is the, the easiest way to, to, to see it. And this is something that we were also thinking about when there is no, no, not only water. So also when you have the street, if you think about a city, the street itself are the biggest part of, 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 of public space. If you think about when you walk around a city, you're on a sidewalk and you have all the space for the cars that is used very heavily in the rush hours, but maybe it's empty at 11 or maybe it's empty at, uh, at, at 11 in, in the morning or when people are having lunch and maybe then it's busy again and then it's empty again at night. What happens if we start changing the public space dynamically to with the things that people are doing? So if during the day, for example, it's a place where cars um, can go, but during the night we transform this space into a place where people can have a neighborhood party. Or what happens if during the weekend this becomes uh, a quarter where people, uh, when people can uh, use it in different ways or it becomes uh, the, the neighborhood market. So thinking about the different ways that we can use the public space that we already have and the city that is already there, the city infrastructure that is already there could be a way to, 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 to let's say, a, a better life for people in the future in the cities. And I think... Oh, well, this is just a, 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 a picture of the lo-fi prototype that we did. This, this, this was something that we developed in the summer of 2018 with, uh, with uh, Google's sister company, Sidewalk Labs. And we had this ex exhibited for, for the whole summer in Toronto. Um, and this was a little bit of how just an idea for people to go play with the, with the dynamic street. So I think this policy perspective, I think uh, I'm going to skip it if, if, if you want to discuss it later on, I think it, it's uh, just a little part of how we can get this through collaborative planning to happen in our cities. But um, I think I'm going to stop here and, uh, and, and perhaps give way to the, to the next presenters. Just as, as, as Boise did, I, I, I left my contact if, if everyone wants to, if anyone wants to, to, to check it. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, you mentioned that communication with other people was a very important aspect in our everyday life, which I agree with. Um, I think it improves not only our well-being, but also like um, the efficiency of our work. Um, so I think the, project, uh, the projects you showed us are absolutely amazing. Um, they are very interesting, and um, in terms of not only the the meeting points of uh, people and the greenery, but also like it shows us a, a completely new, unexpected vision of the future, um, which kind of reminds me of of the series Black Mirror when you completely don't know what to expect 
right? <laughs> you know this one, I guess. Yeah. So the, I think these innovative ideas are, are exactly the solutions that we need right now in our world. So thank you very much for that. If anyone uh, has any question, uh, just type it down um, and we will ask them at the end in the uh, panel discussion. So I would like to introduce you the uh, next um, speaker. Um, she's a professor and um, researcher um, of University of Silesia at Institute of uh, Culture Studies. Her background and experience in writing, uh, researching and presenting her views allow to um, interdisciplinate studies that she conducts. Consequently, uh, she will analyze themes regarding census and designs methodologies that led to appreciation of them on many uh, conferences. We are delighted to welcome our last speaker and uh, moderator of panel discussion, Magorita Kondiela. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you see, I'm not in the best health condition, but I hope I'll manage. Uh, it's my uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be uh, one of the presenters during this meeting. And uh, about my presentation, I would like to start right now from the sharing of screen. We see it, just in case. Yes. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Can you see? Yes? Yes, yes, we see it. Okay, okay, thank you very much. My presentation will be uh, quite different from those uh, presented by my colleagues before me. And I decided not to concentrate on uh, actually some pictures and even not to concentrate on uh, uh, concepts of architecture because uh, there are uh, there were actually uh, there, 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 there were a lot of them presented during this meeting uh, uh, so far. I decided to concentrate more on the theory actually and some uh, intersection between the theory on uh, and uh, architectural practice. And uh, uh, on the one hand, my presentation uh, is a brief summary. And on the other, it is a kind of supplement to the selected threads taken up uh, in the speeches of uh, my predecessors. <coughs> I'm sorry. Especially Wojtek in the field of uh, issue of sensor, sensor perception and the uh, importance of sensor information obtained through the senses. In this case, I mean, in the case of my presentation, it would be the sense of uh, sight and uh, the information uh, regarding the light. Uh, however, it uh, is not a regular lecture. It is rather sets of remarks which in my opinion are worth drawing uh, the attention of architects. Uh, they concern the problem of uh, the effectiveness of architectural solutions, uh, which uh, practitioners are primarily interested in. Uh, and as a speech was announced as interdisciplinary, uh, I would like to highlight a few threads uh, in a form of remarks uh, where this interdisciplinarity represented by different scientific theories meets in practice and how it may uh, affect architectural architecture uh, impact and the health. Uh, so uh, it will be about the intersection of theories and practice uh, 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 on the example of light and lighting, uh, mostly. Uh, first, uh, it is of course uh, not possible to talk about the light without talking about the site. So, uh, the sight and the light and intersection of problems uh, uh, or issues uh, researchers by researcher and scientists uh, uh, it's uh, I would say very broad and uh, there are a lot of problems 
connected to light and collected to uh, to uh, scientific researchers. Uh, one of the era which is interested in uh, in uh, problems of light is of course neuroscience. And uh, one of the uh, specialists, uh, one of uh, the scientists who is specialized in problems of science and the intersection of light and uh, and uh, uh, neuroscience is uh, Mark Ria. And he's author of numerous uh, articles and uh, books uh, regarding the problems of uh, lighting and light uh, and uh, different contexts uh, for consideration of those two problems. So first remark we should do is that uh, uh, human retina is, uh, well, uh, it's not possible to talk about uh, light without talking about the eye. In one of the uh, element, one of the part of eye, which is specially uh, uh, connected to light is of course retina. Retina is a part of eyes uh, that is, uh, <coughs> that is, um, uh, 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 sensitive to light and uh, it has five types of photoreceptors sensitive to particular uh, wavelengths of electromagnetic radiations uh, short were uh, through medium to long uh, I mean long waves uh, and the uh, part of the retina the fovea uh, especially the center of fovea is uh, covered by only two types of photoreceptors, and those two types sensi are sensitive to long wave radiation and those uh, sensitive to middle wave uh, length radiation. Both are involved in the perception of contrast. Uh, the second remark we should uh, uh, do actually is that uh, response to electromagnetic radiation include both the visual and non-visual system of the ray sensitive retina. Uh, the no pattern responses include, uh, for instance, nocturnal uh, metalonin suppression. Uh, uh, and it is known that today from the neuroscience that 45, 24 hour lighting of the retina has an influence on the biological and circadian rhythm. In the disturbance resulting in numerous disorders, uh, uh, for instance, disorder, uh, sleep disorder, uh, it reduced the, uh, our efficiency, uh, it uh, can, uh, can, uh, can uh, um, also uh, made uh, problems with uh, of a diabetic uh, uh, nature and uh, it uh, can be also problems with uh, uh, even with the cancer so the the spectrum of uh, disorders is actually quite uh, big uh, another uh, non-visual effects uh, which is also connected to non-visual uh, non-visual uh, non-visual responses to the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, uh, means uh, light uh, is uh, our alertness, uh, the alerting effects uh, which uh, actually uh, means that we are not able to, uh, to uh, rest. We are still in the condition uh, prepared for uh, uh, action one by one. So uh, it, it, there are actually the problems with resting. Mm. <clears throat> Probably the best recognized, uh, best recognized visual effect is the challenge uh, in the spectral sensitivity of the peripheral retina from uh, with the amount of radiation incident on the retina. And humans have two classes of photoreceptor Two classes of photoreceptor. Uh, uh, it, uh, there are rods and cones. Uh, as the word level changes from now, uh, uh, the light level changes, uh, nocturnal to daytime, uh, uh, clear spectral sensitivity of peripheral retina gradually changes from the rod dominated sensitivity to the cone dominated sensitivity. It means from night, uh, scotopic uh, uh, light uh, and vision to daytime photopic uh, uh, vision. Uh, the neurons, 
which the neurons that uh, connects the retina with the brain process, uh, uh, which connects the retina to the brain, uh, uh, with the brain process information in the long and medium range of radiation much faster uh, than other neural uh, ch channels. Much of the visual experience uh, relates only to these two types of radiation and these neurons. The other three are ignoring uh, and ignoring uh, other neural ch channels. So they are not representative of the human visual sensitivity of the human retina to radiation. Uh, <coughs> right now, uh, I would like to talk a little about uh, light and lighting. Uh, for, First, uh, about uh, lighting. Uh, actually, lighting in an architectural space give, may give uh, a sense of security, allow us to detect uh, different obstacles, uh, uh, allows, uh, uh, allows uh, to recognize the road, uh, creates an atmosphere for people's meeting, just to name a few function uh, uh, for it. And uh, what is uh, actually, um, very interesting is that uh, with the intention of achieving the, the mentioned effect, architects and also representatives or related uh, professions rely, uh, rarely use uh, uh, the lighting levels recommended by uh, neuroscientists. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one of the source of the problem regarding the lighting in architecture and especially lighting, which we expect will be also the source uh, or will be also promoting uh, the, uh, the health uh, uh, and healthy life. Uh, one of the sources of the states of affairs is uh, the common uh, equation of light and lighting. And uh, for architects, it is necessary to realize that these are not the same phenomena. Light and lighting are not the same phenomena. And such an impression that they are the same can be actually obtained when studying the content of uh, administrative regulations in the field of lighting. And especially, especially when we compare the definition of light with the application of uh, electromagnetic radiation in terms of expected benefits from lighting. And uh, uh, what is also important, and we have to uh, uh, remember, lighting design is based on evidence-based design and its application. And as such, it can provide benefits both for the visual and non-visual sphere uh, uh, Install it at lower energy of uh, environment cost, more fit for purpose, and is reducing the waste of energy. So that is why it is close to neuroscience. And uh, lighting, however, is burdened with the definition of light and its unit, the candle. Uh, regarding light. Uh, light is defined in terms of sensitivity of the human retina to electromagnetic radiation. And actually, no other physical quality has a basic definition of human nature. The unit of light is candela. And the unit was introduced to establish uh, regulatory standards and it uh, is uh, used in the trade and uh, in different uh, international activities, of course. Uh, it measures the intensity of light source I mean, luminous intensity, but it doesn't reflect the main factor of the definition of light, the sensitive to, sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation. So uh, actually it uh, turns, that, turns out that what is good for international operation and uh, tr trade can adversely affect a proper lighting uh, application in practice and uh, works actually against the health. <coughs> Mark Ray stress uh, for electromagnetic radiation uh, is measured in watts uh, without reference to the range of the retina sensitivity spectrum uh, to electromagnetic waves uh, and in the light of its unit used to characterize lighting 
uh, light turns out to be par, uh, particular quant qu uh, quality, uh, quantity. Uh, so it loses, uh, in this context, it loses its qualities. In terms of regulation, other institutions, uh, quite different institutions, regulation, uh, make regulation for the definition of the unit of the lighting efficiency, which is related to the spectrum of the retina sensitivity to, uh, sensitivity to radiation. And as a consequence, the practical measure, uh, measurement of the quality of light is uh, in candela, units can have different definitions. In order to effectively talk about the effectiveness of lighting system, it is first uh, necessary to develop one definition of light that will not be modified due to the different definitions of efficiencies or effective, uh, effectiveness uh, functions of the use of a given type of light. <coughs> so. The fundamental units for describing lighting threats, uh, light uh, as a quanti uh, quantity. Uh, electromagnetic magnetic radiation is measured in watts, uh, so it means that without uh, waging any spectral function. In terms of regulation, quite different institutions uh, are responsible for the definition or regulation of the lighting units and for the function of lighting efficiency. Measurement of light quality in candela units, <coughs> uh, lighting efficiency, uh, sorry, uh, related to the spectrum of the retina sensitivity to radiation. And consequently, the practical measurement of light uh, uh, quality in candela units may have different definitions, as I mentioned it, uh, 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 a moment ago. Uh, there are some institutions uh, um, which uh, try to introduce, um, well, try to introduce or list many light, uh, lighting efficiency function each of which can be used to calculate uh, 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 light source intensely, uh, intensity using the same units uh, simultaneously. There uh, is therefore a need for a single word definition that does not compromise the criteria for the effective use of light. And uh, uh, some of the institutions already introducing new lighting efficiency features based on the neuroscience. Uh, uh, therefore, also the, uh, the postulated by Re, uh, uh, definition of light should also be based on neuroscience. So there is a, a strong postulation uh, uh, for uh, changing the definition of light and the uh, criteria uh, ban based upon this definition. The choice of light and type of light is often not a designer choice, as uh, you know probably very well, but it's uh, regulated by the authorities. Uh, all lighting standards actually are based on photoping lighting. I mean, this lighting which is characteristic to the daylight, the bright light. Uh, photopic uh, luminous efficiency function, and it, therefore it limits the sensitivity of the human eye to the restrictive radiation range. Therefore, engineering, engineering is limited in its usability because engineering is limited to the, uh, to the standards based on photopic luminous efficiency. From the point of view of neuroscience, regulation should be developed that will reflect the difference, differences in the response of the human visual system to differences in illuminates, uh, which, in, uh, which is the case, and uh, the quality, length of light radiation, uh, I mean the retinal sensitivity, sensitivity spectrum, which actually is not the case. Such a regulations doesn't, don't exist. And in order to maximize the benefit of using 
lighting, it is necessary to fine tune the distribution of the spectral radiation on the lighting system to the sensitivity spectrum of the neural channels that provide the desired specific benefits. And if it's not adopted, the lighting will not bring benefits to the user of uh, or economic savings and in uh, and the investment in light will not pay off. Actually, it will be pointless. It will be also pointless uh, in the terms of uh, health, in the terms of health condition. Uh, the, there were a few uh, remarks actually uh, about uh, some, uh, some uh, theories regarding sight and some th theories connected to the sight regarding the light and the uh, qualities of the light. But I would like to also, as my, uh, as my uh, presentation uh, has an interdisciplinary uh, character, I would like to also uh, make some comments to Wojtek. I mean, to this, his, uh, his <coughs> uh, description or his um, uh, description uh, of the senses and its use in uh, uh, application to the architecture, the architectural, com uh, architectural concepts. Actually, uh, this is not so obvious and uh, uh, the Palasma uh, who was uh, uh, mentioned by Wojtek actually uh, is very concerned uh, uh, with the problem of uh, experience, actually sensory experience, but the sensory experience is one is only one of the problems regarding the senses, because the, the problem of the senses in the era of science is uh, actually has <coughs> has two uh, general uh, um, question. The most general question which are connected to the problem of conceptualizing of the senses. Actually, first is how do we distinguish a sense from the other source, source of information? Uh, receiving uh, of information receiving faculties because the human organism had uh, has a lot of uh, systems of receiving information from the environment and the second question is by what principle do we distinguish sep uh, and or separate the senses from each other and this is the question which palasma doesn't ask he is not interested in this problem, and from the uh, science point of view, it is actually one of the basic problems. And uh, uh, without uh, making any solution uh, or any concept, without describing the concept of the, uh, the senses, actually we cannot to, to tell about the senses anything, and also about the sensory experience. Uh, maybe we can describe this uh, experience, but there is uh, there will be no knowledge which uh, can be possible to uh, implement uh, also in architectural concept without conceptualizing the senses. So uh, to presenting the way which uh, how the senses are understood in a different context, because uh, actually uh, almost all of the science is concerned with senses has its own. Uh, has its own concept of the senses and sensory perception. Some of the uh, some of some of the uh, uh, authors uh, uh, of the concept, and so uh, some of the theoreticians uh, uh, which were interested and uh, conducted researches in the era of uh, perception and in the era of uh, sensory perception, especially was uh, were Matthew Nats uh, and Mohan Matten. Matthew Nats uh, were uh, is a researcher in the era of uh, the cultural sciences and Mohan Matten is uh, researching in the era of psychology and the philosophy. And uh, according to Matthew, the sense is intuitive concept uh, employed for the certain everyday purposes. And uh, uh, in my opinion, this is the concept which is actually uh, utilized by architects very often uh, 
this is the main concept of the sense which actually is utilized by architects. And uh, the, second, uh, the second element of this concept is that uh, the sense does not have objective scientific context. In this concept, in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, context, uh, sense doesn't need a scientific knowledge to conceptualize the sense and to utilize the sense. It, it is a, the scientific, scientific knowledge is not necessary. Uh, because uh, the concept of the sense relies simply on the societal agreement or on the convention. And uh, in this uh, context, the sense is uh, defined externally. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the criteria for conceptualizing us, uh, of the senses are external, not internal. They, they are outside of the human body or if they are part, of course, because they are part of human body, their the, uh, the activity is directed towards the environment, environment, not towards the uh, human body or inside of the human body. Uh, in turn, according to Mohan Matan, sense is intentionally defined. It is not given in intuition. And uh, uh, if we have an intuition of the sense, and actually it is, uh, certain concept uh, uh, applied to the, or uh, uh, utilized, uh, or is given in a, a certain intuition, a per particular intuition of particular person. And uh, according to Martin, there may be a several different, but overlapping concepts, uh, and they can be determined by the explanatory on conversional context. So the way of conceptualizing senses are in fact very, very uh, different. So, and uh, giving uh, the particular concept, uh, the applying of the sensory information or the understanding of sensory information may be differ and, and may differ, uh, differs in different uh, cultures and for different, of course, purposes. So this is one of the benefits when we look at the problems, also with uh, the problems which are uh, uh, implemented to the architecture from the science point of view and scientific point of view. Uh, and uh, I think that today, this knowledge is absolutely unnecessary for every architect. As you see, when we look back to the antiquity, uh, then this, b b the distinction uh, based on five senses and sensory organs, because the criteria for uh, uh, for uh, separating uh, senses from each other, from uh, the criteria for a definition of the senses, actually was based on uh, mainly uh, and primarily on the uh, five uh, sensory organs and uh, this definition and this uh, this criteria were, were developed by uh, or even uh, maybe better was present in the Aristotle uh, philosophy already uh, and uh, wh why it was uh, uh, the main criteria for uh, conceptualizing the senses and one was because the they were effective tools for detecting sensory information in the outside world. So it was one. And the second uh, was because they were capable of learning. And the third uh, important was because partially ex they were partially accessible to the consciousness of the observer of the environment. And what does it mean? It suggests to uh, us that not every sensory information is uh, accessible to our uh, consciousness, not uh, every sensory information we are aware of, and that means that not every sensory information we can use or utilize in architecture, even if it acts in environment. So it is very important to know that the criteria of five senses are not, uh, uh, not enough, they are not actually uh, um, uh, efficient, efficient enough 
uh, uh, to base entire designing, for instance, only uh, in, with the connection to those uh, those five senses. I mean those uh, those basic elements, uh, which are the base for the distinction of the five senses. I mean physical organs, uh, uh, physical organs. Every uh, for every sense, we know the physical organ is quite different. And when uh, the neuroscience was developed, uh, the vision or the conceptualizing of senses uh, changed uh, dramatically because uh, physical organ was replaced with the energy and the st stimulants. And the properties of receptors uh, was those uh, who, uh, determine the modalities of the sensory system. Uh, but uh, uh, right now the situation is giving into consideration that the technology is uh, uh, still developing and it is more and more advanced that uh, in the nearest future there will be a fusion of physical and a virtual dimension. So the biology and artificial products will connect and we will be talking about the sensory uh, information also and about the sensory, uh, sensory organs and the concept quite different, even if we it is in if uh, we talk from the perspective of neuroscience. So uh, this is uh, another uh, this is another profit uh, from uh, uh, considering the different or uh, theories from the different sciences, different areas. Uh, then architecture uh, and benefit they can uh, benefit. Uh, to architecture, I think in many areas and in many problems. Uh, and I think uh, it is, uh, I would like to finish in that moment. Thank you very much for your, for your presence and for your attention. Thank you so much, Małgorzata. Um, in our opinion, we've been also discussing it and it's sometimes it's really, in our opinion, it's, sometimes it's really important and significant to listen different pro professions, different professionals uh, to understand what we are looking at, what we are uh, hearing, what we, what we are smelling uh, or how we generally, how we percept these uh, surroundings uh, that we are located in, that we inhabit. And also it includes the space of living as uh, we get to know them very well for the last few months. And I think that invitation of Małgorzata was really significant to explain and understand what Wojciech and Justyna uh, were saying, but in, in more theoretical ways. And I think it, it was done uh, uh, beautifully and I hope many can relate to um, uh, these factors. And also I think it highlights that um, sometimes we don't need to maybe consider uh, that, that is not, it is not necessary to consider everything. Um, what, what we, uh, sorry, uh, one more time. <laughs> uh, sometimes that parameters don't need to be uh, considered, but maybe it's better to reconsider them. Uh, and this is what Le Corbusier was saying, and this is what I want to come back in, in the latest stage. But for now, I would like to wait a little bit longer uh, with the final conclusions. And because the structure of this symposium was arranged to give us all knowledge that is required to debate. And I hope uh, you can uh, relate to after the talks of professionals from different countries and with different specializations. And Małgorzata, who was just speaking, um, will lead this panel discussion and ask the uh, questions to our guest speakers. Uh, and if you want, you may ask the questions as I was mentioning to you earlier, uh, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It is uh, my great pleasure to moderate this discussion. And actually, I have two basic questions for all of the uh, uh, guest speakers. Uh, for we have a lot of questions uh, on a chat uh, window. So it looks like uh, a lot uh, a lot of students are uh, waiting for responses for their for their questions and for they uh, and prepared to and prepared to listen to 
answers uh, from our for our guest speaker. So I would like to uh, ask you two, two basic questions. First is, will the coronavirus really revolutionize architecture? Uh, I mean, crises require quick re reaction and uh, architectural projects, especially the large scale opens, uh, 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 large, scale, uh, large scale ones. But uh, the, the problem which is connected to that is actually whether those, uh, those, uh, uh, those, uh, those, uh, solutions actually are good for the societies, I mean for the people, whether they are connect or they are divide societies in the future. And uh, maybe I would like to start from, uh, from Will. Will, could you be so nice? I think the, 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 the real question I was trying to get to, which I think we're all kind of wrestling with and understanding the, uh, the nature. I mean, coronavirus is essentially antisocial, isn't it? It prevents us from doing the things that we uh, have become uh, accustomed to and understand how the, 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 the success of cities and architecture and the design of cities um, thrives. As, you know, as we human beings, um, you know, Jan Gale would say, you know, we're, we're social animals. We, we need to do that. The coronavirus had told us that, that under certain circumstances, we, are, we should not uh, act in that way. What it's actually done in doing that is to, is to reveal, I think, underneath um, that, some of the qualities of our cities, which are either um, ignored by um, city makers, architects, uh, investors, developers, where when one understands the actual essence of quality of, 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 of what makes a, a, a city work, um, those, those things have been brought to the fore. I'm, um, I think one of the characteristics of our business, our world, is that we have to, if we're dealing with the future, we're intrinsically optimistic, are we? <laughs> I mean, I hope so. If we're not, we're kind of, we're in a rather dark place. So the optimism really is about the nature of um, using this moment and, and, and understanding the kind of terrible kind of impact it's having on society, but turning that in and this idea of acceleration being ones where people are taking, as we heard from Juan and others about, about un really understanding the interrelationship between physical and digital in our, in our, in our cities. I um, mean, my experience, and I'll, I'll, I'll let others come in here, my experience about the reaction to Milton Keynes have been fascinating in that um, there are a number of people who are kind of resisting the idea that what we've had in the last um, 20 years or so in terms of making a thing, um, will, um, it'll be all right. It'll be the same. When we come out of this, we have, we'll have a vaccination. By the way, I've just had a text to tell me how my vaccination is, uh, is booked in for Saturday. So uh, give you a clue about my, my generational kind of step here. But the bit that I think we, we are trying to do is to, for those that are making decisions about the cities, to give them the evidence that allows them to go back to some of those kind of what I would call some eternal truths about human beings interacting, working, living in the city that will allow them to um, uh, re, reinvest or, 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 or reimagine the cities to, to, to work at that level. Um, but I think others will maybe come in and take a, hopefully, a different view, you know, to make a debate about it. Thank you very much. What about you, Stina? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so I think that uh, maybe it will uh, revolutionize uh, our thinking. Uh, no man knows uh, and cannot know what the final uh, outcome of a given uh, course will be for themselves and uh, of others. Architecture is about, uh, it's about solving problems uh, and needs uh, that currently uh, affect us. It is also uh, associated with uh, an attempt to predict the future presenting ways and manners uh, of the best uh, possible solution, I, I, I think. Um, architecture has been changing and evolving from, uh, for uh, centuries, so we have to face uh, this solution, but anyway, um, I wouldn't call it a revolution. 
Um, I think that uh, the challenge uh, in architecture professions uh, faces uh, in, in the COVID era, it is uh, discover and uh, take advantage of the opportunities crea created by the um, rapidly developing uh, co uh, computer technology and the uh, ability to obtain maybe another process and manage huge amounts of data and information um, at a rapid pace. Mm, and the most important, I think, that um, uh, is the cooperation uh, with specialists in, uh, in other uh, fields uh, of science, uh, such as uh, programming engineer, uh, modern technologies, uh, robotics, uh, biotechnology, um, um, have also uh, entered the domain uh, of, uh, of architecture. Um, I, uh, I thought about uh, materials uh, because uh, I think that uh, it's uh, a very important uh, uh, where we live uh, and uh, uh, what is op opposite uh, of, uh, of us. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that, and I wish everyone that these uh, changes are connected with the uh, awareness concerning the role of architecture uh, and its influence uh, of the human organism. Um, we talk about uh, health, uh, this is the topic, uh, this conference, and I think that organism is not only a structure, but the characteristic way of the interaction of the space materials and the outside world surrounding us, which have huge uh, influence uh, on mental and uh, physical uh, condition. Uh, so, um, for example, um, there are phenomena such as uh, sick building syndrome. Uh, this syndrome is connected with a health condition of uh, building users and concerns to little amount of uh, pressure and the bad quality of the uh, finishing uh, of the facility. Uh, so um, physical and chemical uh, properties of the used materials have, uh, ha have a key impact of our health. Uh, I think that, uh, that because of the uh, pandemic uh, solution, uh, we can pay uh, more attention to it uh, in the uh, design uh, process. Despite uh, cultural, uh, historical and uh, climate differences, um, I think that people behave similarly and they look for uh, the same. For example, uh, contact with uh, another people, warmth, hope, love, a lot of uh, a safe future and uh, a place for their own. Uh, these are human uh, humans' uh, basic needs, uh, I think. And um, uh, for me, uh, the most surprising uh, was the fact that uh, people uh, doesn't themselves start uh, talking about uh, their needs. Um, I talked to my friend and many of them ask uh, whether it is possible to design a place for uh, growing plants uh, in, in, housing, in housing projects. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, on the one hand, uh, COVID is awful, but the, the other hand, um, another people think about uh, environment, ecology, uh, uh, better, better places uh, in, in the earth. Um, so, um, so I hope that the cities uh, of the future will be based on the sustainable development theory and ecology and natural environment. Uh, as the basic good for society will be the a role of, of economy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, I see as we're running out of time, I have the second question for, uh, for Juan and for Wojciech. Could you tell me what are your biggest uh, threats and biggest hopes for the future uh, regarding the situation with the pandemic? Biggest hopes and biggest threats uh, in the area of architecture, of course, for you as a designers. Yeah, I think I think it's very connected to to what we were discussing before. I think um, it, the fact of of of, of having such a, a worldwide impact um, with the pandemic, it helps us rather than changing the way that we live, accelerating some changes that we were already seeing. So my hope in that sense is that we can. Uh, for example, find a, a healthier work-life balance uh, to just help people living a, 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 a better life through um, the, the introduction of, of simple things. So the fact that people can work from home, the fact that people have a digital infrastructure where they can do a lot of the, of the things that they do now, maybe physically and save time for uh, what matters the most. And I think it's, it's what Justino was just saying about meeting people, uh, like the basic needs that are blocked, as, as, as Will was saying, by, by this antisocial um, pandemic. So I think that is the, 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 the biggest hope. And I think the biggest threat is when this is not happening. So I think the biggest threat that, that we can have from, from, from the pandemic is that some of the measures that are meant to limit the way that we, that we uh, carry uh, life as we do it, that some of those could stay and just <laughs> make us make us a little bit less social than than, than we're used to. But I, I I feel the way that I see it is that this is a possibility that is that is very very remote, and the biggest possibility is that through uh, through the pandemic we can actually improve a lot the, the way that we that we live and we can leap forward um, uh, with the changes that we were that we were already seeing people. Um, connecting all around the world. So, so some of this, some of this, let's say the, the more positive things that the pandemic uh, brought, um, that these can become a sort of uh, more um, like, like a new normal of, of some sort that is not the one that we have been seeing, that, that we have been seeing the past year. And I think in this sense, nowadays, or what we can see today, of course, because of the big hit that this had and like the, the big um, emotional hit that the pandemic has, it's hard to, 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 to get out and see the big picture. But I think when we just go out and see it historically, we would see that during this, this, this couple of years or during this period of time, some big changes happen in a faster way that, would, so that, that, that we could have expected and changes that could have lasted a generation um, without the pandemic, through the pandemic, we can have them perhaps in just two to five years or something like that. Okay, uh, uh, you are uh, uh, explaining, uh, uh, answer the question quite generally, but I would like to ask you of a more specific answer. I mean, uh, what, what, you, what you afraid the most in this period? Um, not being able to travel, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other, and the, uh, in the terms of architecture and the practice. In the terms of architecture and the practice, I think the biggest your fear, biggest fear. The biggest fear is yeah. for art, for for new construction to stop. Actually, this is the biggest fear that I have because I think when everything stopped, I think the biggest fear that I that I had was for for the cities to stop evolving. So for actually. That it, it, it's a general fear, just the stop, and a particular fear that is like, will I be out of a job <laughs> in the next few months? So I, I, I don't know if that is what you meant. <laughs> well, it was your biggest fear. That's uh, what I meant. <laughs> Thank you. Wojtek, how about you? Okay, so uh, about me, um, what I've noticed during the pandemic is that uh, people realized uh, what is important for them, both in the positive way and in the negative way. So I must say that uh, I agree with what Justyna said previously, that uh, the coronavirus will affect architecture, but it won't be a revolution because uh, uh, we are conscious about our need for proximity of things. We know about our need uh, to be close uh, to green spaces uh, in the city. So these are some needs that uh, 
it's not like that that these human needs appeared right now uh, right now uh, when the pandemic has started but this is something that um, these are people needs that existed always but now we as people but also as architects are more conscious about them so my hope is uh, that uh, in architecture um, we will be more concentrated uh, in human needs than uh, it's been previously and we'll be more conscious on uh, what the human needs will be and the second thing that i would like to touch is the digital revolution and for me it's both a hope and a threat uh, because uh, it was great that what juan carlos presented during uh, his uh, presentation when he presented some examples of uh, how the digital technology can help us in our everyday life and in the future. But on the other hand, I'm afraid if uh, the digital technology won't uh, dominate our life. Because imagine that uh, currently um, we are doing a lot of things at once. And uh, for example, you are driving a car and um, with, uh, with uh, the, our second hand, uh, we are using a mobile phone and writing uh, a message. So our uh, iPhones and our smartphones uh, accompany us um, very, every day. Each week I receive a notification from my smartphone how many hours a day I spend and I'm always uh, scared. Oh, wow, it's so many hours every day that I spend with our iPhones. And um, because of that, uh, our life moves to the, to, to moves, uh, to the digital sphere. And um, I'm afraid that in the future, it uh, will uh, be bigger and bigger and uh, the digital devices will dominate our life even more, uh, even more uh, than, uh, than now. But uh, so, so it's also interesting what Juan Carlos uh, thinks uh, about that in t and uh, if he's not afraid of that in the future. Carlos, Juan? No, no, I need to, like, um, as part of, uh, <laughs> of, the, of the kind of vision that we have here in the studio, uh, we always have a, 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 like, almost a blind um, faith in technology. But I think the important thing with that is, is that technology needs to be used just, um, just uh, it's, it's a means, it's not the objective. So it's just a means to, a, to an end that is improving people's life. So in the moment that, that, that it becomes something um, beyond that, then we have a problem. But as long as we can just use it as we have used other instruments like throughout history to improve the way that we live, I think we're, we're good to go like less Black Mirror and more like uh, something different. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And how about Will? I'm very curious about your answer. I'm mute. I think, the, well, it's the question about um, uh, the excitements and the fears, I think one of the things that I would reflect on is that um, in terms of the, digi the our digital world that we live in and this virtual world, this is an extraordinary um, transformation for all of us. Um, and in a, there would have been a time not that long ago, but in my, in my sort of working practice, where I would have used a pen to make a drawing I would have photographed it. I would have sent it to a laboratory for it to be converted into slides. And I would have put those slides in a projector and taken it to a place where everybody um, gathered. And um, the time in that, that, that um, we were then, we were on, uh, at the mercy of that technology. If the laboratory didn't process the film at the right time or all of those things. So that's, we um, we've adapted and we evolve, and I think the you know the question about the about um, digital we we you know we should adapt and take. My greatest hope is that what I'm seeing around our way in which we we value and react to our carbon uh, impact on the on the planet is one that this pandemic has shown. I love to travel. We need to travel. We kind of we're we're that that. But actually, the way in which we are now um, seeing the potential for for um, for our change in lifestyles to have a beneficial effect on the quality of cities or the quality of the planet um, should not be lost. And we should, um, we should. For me, the greatest opportunity 
is to think about um, uh, 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 really embracing a debate uh, and action on, uh, we've got the um, COP26 conference in Glasgow this year about what the pandemic actually has taught us about the way in which we um, uh, consume and use carbon across the planet. And if we are able to use that from it, I think that will be the greatest, uh, you know, we'll all want to get together and have coffee somewhere. Right. Now I can see that, you know, we, you know, one, one of maybe Alexander's uh, commitments to us all is that uh, when this is over, we'll meet somewhere in uh, Central Europe and um, have a, uh, have a coffee and a, and a proper conversation in, in convivial surroundings. But let's try and, um, you know, uh, the, my fear would be we'd lo we lose, we lose the opportunity to change our direction about on which we're operating our, um, our, our, our on our planet. And, um, you know, our, uh, our successive generations won't thank us for that. They never would, they would never would do under the, but certainly on this opportunity that's presented to us. And what about uh, the fears and, uh, and hopes in terms of health? Actually, it's the, the main issue, the main topic of this meeting. Well, if I just quickly on health, I think, I think we, we know, um, I think physical health and, and moving and, and being, being active and in what we're doing um, and, and space, all of those things we're, we're learning a little bit about how recalibrating that. But the thing that I think we've all um, are really wrestling with is mental health. The fact that we have to have this conversation in isolation and the, um, the evidence that is being gathered in the, up my city here in Milton Keynes by the Community Foundation about vital science shows enormous um, uh, harmful impacts on a young generation. I mean, Milton Keynes has a very high proportion of young people in it. It's a used, new city with young people in it. And understanding that, that is, uh, and dealing with it um, beyond any kind of what I would call physical health issues is perhaps um, the city's greatest challenge. Maybe, maybe, digit, maybe technology and, and our digital world can help, but we equally know that you know, when, when, when you do get the message, as I do, that I've, you know, how many hours I've used on my phone, this is part of the problem. And we need to become much more savvy about the way our younger uh, citizens are able to embrace that and prepare themselves for their future in, in, a, in a healthy, uh, healthy way. And I'm, 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 I am concerned about that. And I don't have the answer now. And I hope that as people are working on it, they will get closer to an answer on that um, beyond all the other things we're trying to wrestle with around our, uh, our homes and, um, and, and places of work. Very much. Last, uh, last answer, Juan. In terms of health. I it don't help because, because uh, um, when, when I, um, I wonder, uh, and I also talked uh, about it during the lecture, um, that uh, our independence uh, is turning uh, into interdependence. Um, COVID uh, partially uh, restricts our freedom uh, to concern is too much, uh, maybe too much technology with less uh, free and artistic uh, thoughts, uh, uh, for example, uh, related to to travel uh, and uh, meeting another uh, people uh, and places, mm, but uh, mm, uh, but it, it's something like the the challenge uh, for for us and for architectural profession uh, to discover uh, another ways. For example, thanks. <laughs> You know, okay. Wojtek? Mm, okay, the, so, so I will answer in another way, uh, because uh, also I will touch uh, my topic from, uh, from uh, the lecture, which was census, because uh, about the health, uh, because I think it's also connected with our brain. And uh, I must say that our brain is uh, very lazy. It, uh, our brain doesn't like uh, something like information overload. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, when you get a new smartphone, 
and uh, you say that, um, well, I need uh, one week to get familiarized with that. It means that it's uh, designed uh, in a bad way because um, we have uh, to sacrifice the energy of our brain to learn it. And uh, that's how architecture should uh, look like. It uh, shouldn't, uh, our, the architecture should be clear when we design a space uh, we shouldn't concentrate on designing a brave form that, uh, that um, will be dominating uh, the environment, but it, sh it should be clever. So uh, when, uh, when we design that, uh, we, our buildings and our interiors and uh, our public spaces, our urban spaces, it should be as simple as possible. And uh, when I'm saying as simple as possible, I mean that uh, when I get to, to, to a building, I don't have to think where to go, where is the entrance, where, are, uh, where is the room that I'm looking for, but uh, it, should be, it should be obvious. So that's, uh, that, that's uh, the first thing. It means our mental, uh, the health of our brain, but also, um, also, uh, it's about um, our physical health. So once again, I will get back to I will get back uh, to um, um, what Justina said because she mentioned the sick building syndrome, and during her presentation, she also said about uh, changing our mind about uh, about materials. Um, and so she gave some examples of obvious materials and non-obvious materials. So. Um, we should design, we should use uh, innovative materials to make our buildings also health for our physical health. So it means uh, materials that are not uh, producing any, any poisonous uh, effects uh, on, uh, on our health. Thanks. And the last answer, because uh, closing this discussion, Juan? I think, I think, it... The, the biggest fear, of course, it's 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 more related to to mental health. So I think it's a it's the um, it's what we what we saw most affected uh, it's most affected recently. I think the the physical health is something that we that we have had as a as a as a subject from 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 quite a bit, and it's something that we can do a lot of work into. But I think that the subject of mental health was something that was really brought up by the, by the, by the pandemic and by this, by this last um, uh, months and the, this last year um, situation. So I think my biggest fear is that if we don't do, if we don't do something to change um, the way that we, that we build and that we, um, in, in general, go about our lives in terms of, of having a mental, mental health, I think that would be a, a, big, a big problem for sure. Okay, thank you very much for all the answers, for the participation in this discussion. And uh, I wish you all a lot of health <laughs> for now and for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Just a few questions from the audience uh, to a few particular person. And the first one, there is a question from Saris, if I pronounce it well, to Will. Um, which city layout, style, uh, radical or grid or linear, do you think is the most successful one? Oh, that's, it's, it, uh, th th it's not a choice. It was, it, in a sense, both work, both work in their own terms for, for whatever. In, 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 the, in the particular situation where um, they chose, or the, the consultant team back in the early um, 1970s, at late 1960s, chose a grid, was on the idea of endless, um, in kind of infinite, so that the, 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 there was the sense that um, uh, the Milton Keynes model was one of um, uh, open-ended planning. It was about, less, less about the sort of the idea, which is, I mean, the, the radial plan is a classic form for um, the marketplace or the, um, or the civic uh, city. The idea that the grid is more democratic was the argument for it. Um, so depending on where and how you wish to kind of shape the future, each, each of those, as long as they've, as it were, the kind of put the, um, the requirements of each are fully met and, and, and run through. The, the tension with the grid system in Milton Keynes is that um, uh, people imagine Milton Keynes as being radial, 
<laughs> and that sent that sends a whole series of different discussions about what what constitutes cent cent uh, centrality and radiality. I think the issue for um, uh, for any any future plan would be that um, the circumstances, the politics, the people, the communities that will shape it will determine it. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope Saris is uh, delighted to hear this answer. And the next one from Silla is about uh, to Juan. Um, what about the strategy that is not about planimetric form and style? You need to. It's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting one because I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure what, uh, what, uh, what is meant by that. So I think, I think most of the strategies, when you, when you build, are not necessarily, and, and, and in particular with the projects that I was, that I was showing, they don't come from, from form or from style, but they come more from um, the, the, the people. So I think that the important thing, and it's, it's also the center of the way that we, that we approach projects here. I think it's a good way in general to do to do architecture is to start from the way that people will leave the spaces, to start from user experience, from the way that, 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 that people will do things in there. And then the, the design is an important part to do, but it will respond a lot to this. So I think if we can think more of how we respond to the needs of people and the changing needs of people, especially, we can we can come to 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 a, to a clear strategy on how to design. So rather rather that than form, I think forms. I mean, we're architects, and I think we, it's it's something that we that we we're very passionate about. But uh, sometimes it should come second to the first strategy that is um, uh, people. Okay, F thank you so much. And the last one to all of you. Uh, and how can we taste and smell across digital platforms? I can I can go first. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. So I, 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 that is that is a very interesting one because I think digital platforms are never going to be a, a replacement of of, of physical uh, ways of, of 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 encountering, and especially with smell and taste, are very are very like let's say in-person experiences, but I, it, there are very, very interesting experiments going around the world with, um, with uh, ways of sharing these other senses that are not only visual, that is the only, I mean, visual and, and, and sound uh, stimulants that are the ones that we get from experiences like these nowadays. Um, and then there are super interesting uh, experiments. And I think Wojtek knows, knows, knows more about this, about synesthetic experiences that you can get in um, simulators. So I think there will be very, very interesting developments in this term in, in, in the future. And the, the only thing that I can say is that it would be very, very interesting that we can do it, but it, the best thing that can happen is that we can still do it physically, of course. Okay, so I can go second, uh, just uh, after Juan Carlos. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there are some vital functions that cannot be replaced with uh, digital technologies. So. Uh, I wouldn't like to treat the digital platforms as uh, something that will to substitute uh, all our life, but as something that will support uh, our our vital our vital functions. So I hope that um, in the future we will have um, something like uh, buildings with uh, sensory data. Uh, that will, uh, I don't know, check temperature and um, adjust uh, air conditioning uh, in our building. So that's something that we can relate uh, to, to, to the sense of smell. But uh, of course, uh, it won't replace uh, our standard uh, receptions uh, and stimulants uh, stimulating these uh, two senses mentioned in the questions. So, so you, you really think that we should put more technology into the building strategy to come back, for example, to vernacular ideas uh, of different traditions and locations? Mm, yes and no, because uh, it depends on the technologies. If uh, these are technologies that uh, will improve our lifestyle, and uh, I mean our social lifestyle and our physical lifestyle, yes, but we should be aware uh, of uh, technologies that will dominate uh, our life. Uh, so, so 
uh, we will uh, be concentrating to, uh, with these technologies instead of uh, what is important for us, uh, which is uh, spending time with people and uh, some social activities. Also related to our senses. Okay, uh, no, I'm I'm just uh, I'm just a little bit afraid of using this uh, using more and more technology. As uh, you probably heard now, there is this new concept in Saudi Arabia, yeah, where they want to build this linear city, which is I don't know, 170 kilometers long, and that is going to be directed and led by artificial in intelligence. And for me, this is exactly this uh, scenario from almost from Black Mirror when you know technology is taking control of everything in some way. And it becomes very easy. Of course, you know, we got this Elon Musk who, who is directing and who is creating these rules around uh, this topic, around this theme. But still, in my opinion, if there is artificial intelligence, it becomes so much uh, smarter than us that it can do whatever she, he or it wants. I, I, agree, with you. I agree with you. Um, so we should take care not to create uh, some these kind of technologies that will affect uh, not affect but dominate our life. So uh, it should help us, but, but only support us, not dominate us. And I'm also afraid of what you are saying, but uh, I think that is the future because imagine, uh, well, 15 years ago, uh, nobody could uh, think about platforms like uh, Facebook, like uh, like uh, uh, smartphones, etc. Uh, the world looked like abs in an absolutely different uh, way that were many the style of spending our free time our leisure time was absolutely different but now we got familiarized to, to um, the technologies that we have now so i think that uh, i think that in the future uh, we will have more technologies uh, that will give us more and more functions mm, but all, and I don't know if it will be better or, or worse. Um, I don't know if uh, the fact that we have smartphones with uh, all these functions, if it's good, perhaps. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who say that 15 years ago it was better when we had no internet uh, or it was uh, the beginnings of internet. We had no smartphones and uh, our phones were used only to call someone and um, we had no messengers, etc. Shall I come in there? Because you, you, oh, Justina, after you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I attend a lecture on uh, fragrance uh, where it was uh, shown uh, how technology supports the senses. Uh, for example, um, the scent of luxury and leather and that is uh, associated with uh, luxury is applied to uh, Royce Royce uh, and uh, uh, another cars, for example, uh, Mercedes. The same um, is now done uh, in hotels. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, these uh, this platforms uh, and digital platforms and this technology, um, it's our future. Actually, I would say it is our present already. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just quickly come in because you mentioned something about um, what was it like 50 years ago. You know, I think one of the things that strikes me is that I am I'm conscious that there is now a, a you know, there is a community of digital natives. I mean, I I struggle, but I'm enjoying the kind of struggle to be um, a, a, equipped. The optimist in me about this platform, this the community is about the is about the positives that communication can give. We see so many negatives, but there are positives in that that the the communication of information that helps people change attitudes about the way we live and and to, and, and about the ways in which we can reach a much greater uh, range of people with a, with the right sort of story. It gives me some hope that it can be used to the best. I also think that we will be seeing places um, unlike this um, line or whatever, which, you know, which, which it sounds horrific, but, but actually places which I know exist, which is in the presence where you go, where you can leave your phone at the door. You know, there is no Wi-Fi. There is no communication. There's the smell of the grass, the flowers, the sounds of the birds, and the, and and the wind in the trees. 
and the taste of the water, fresh water and things that are really, really important to us. And the issue around that is the, at the moment it's becoming, um, the, these are things that people are actually discovering are important to them. It's the extent to which it becomes a major part of our lives and helps us then to, if, if it's necessary, re-import those back into the cities that we are helping shape and design. And we're seeing that in some of the presentations today. People value that. And, and we, we're using digital to get to, a, get to the demonstration where we can deliver that. But that isn't the end. The, 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 pur the purpose of it is to help us to get to that world, Thomas More's utopia, but without you know, driving us mad on the way. So I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put my phone down now. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. And that, yes, that, that's why I'm uh, talking about nature and the materials uh, from which architecture is, uh, is made. Uh, but um, that's why I, I will agree, agree with you. So. And I, I think that this, the, the conclusions that we came up now and uh, for the last few sentences is maybe that as Le Corbusier uh, was saying that we, we need to introduce and uh, consider the wise design of space and light. And it was almost a hundred years ago. And maybe we should include to this, the wise design of technology or maybe internet as well. And I think this is a really good conclusion also in terms of the healthy architecture that we need to um, maybe not reconsider, but consider. This is what I wanted to say uh, a few sentences, a few paragraphs uh, before. And there were really, really interesting uh, comments. And I would love to quote one of them of Justina that COVID is awful. Or the, the Juan's uh, sentence, we can leap forward with changes. And these are two opposite comments regarding what we what we are meeting right now in our situation, uh, in the post-pandemic situation almost, as we get vaccines and we are getting better uh, almost every day. And also I wanted to uh, explain a little bit and very briefly what I meant by uh, giving an example of the Parthenon. And may maybe it is the past, but what we uh, can learn from it is that Sometimes we don't need to, you know, uh, create new things. We, we don't need to innovate in new, new things. Sometimes it's better to use what we have, maybe what we have learned, uh, and to initiate with this new solutions. Yeah, new new solutions with already existing knowledge that we got plenty of, uh, of it. I, I I suppose this is my, my opinion, and maybe we go too fast. Maybe we'll, there, there is another way of approaching uh, what we are meeting right now. I don't want to give answers and I, and I think that you didn't also give answers. And I, that, that was my goal of this symposium, that it wasn't necessary to give answers, but give reflections and give questions that we can consider during designing the buildings and public spaces or other um, projects. And I hope all of you can relate. And now you, all of the audience uh, that came here and spent these three hours or, or just three hours have really interesting uh, thoughts that may include or may approach or, or may develop the uh, stu students um, or professionals uh, ideas. Thank you so much. That I, I hope you understood my, my last thoughts <laughs> um, and I hope you all loved it. It was a great Thank pleasure you. to have you all to have questions and... Thank you for all the organizers for invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bye. Thank you for the invitation and a great initiative. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>